Now, it's Friday. It's last day. Let's show some of that energy. Good morning. morning. All right. We're going to go ahead and get things kicked off this morning. Did y'all enjoy yourselves on yesterday? Let's give us a round of applause for yesterday if you enjoyed yourself. All right. We are the... We, we, we're thin in number, but we're mighty in spirit, as we would say on Sunday morning. Amen. But we're going to keep it rolling. We're going to keep the show going uh, today. Uh, we're going to kick things off with uh, session 19. Uh, and we'll start with our health and wellness, uh, the second round of our health and wellness uh, talk. And we'll begin with uh, cultural and social justice competency in college athletics. And that will be with Caroline Briquette from Mercer University. I pray I said that name right. And we'll be bringing Caroline up. So let's give uh, Caroline a round of applause, please. Good morning. Um, you know, I teach in the evening, so this is like, whoo. Uh, so I'm going to get through it, though. I, um, I hope that what I present today sort of brings together a lot of the concepts that have been talked about throughout this conference. Um, I teach in a uh, master's and PhD program in counseling, and I do teach a course in um, advocacy and social justice. And so a lot of the principles that I talk about today are going to be principles that I teach to my students, but also that I use in my consulting work. Um, and I think that it fits uh, with college athletics. And I have experience um, working as a mentor um, with um, Division I football teams and also doing some counseling with athletes. And I think that um, some of the issues that they bring to me are issues that could be addressed within athletics, um, especially if we work on increasing cultural competency and then also social justice um, advocacy awareness for those who work with athletes, um, student athletes. Uh, and one of the things that I think is very important is that we begin to really address the issues, which I think we're doing here, um, but also working with others so that they recognize what some of the issues are, and then that way we can effectively address what some of the concerns are and what some of the solutions might be. Uh, as, as has been talked about, and, I, and I, when I previously spoke uh, last year about mental um, health, um, some of the issues that we're seeing with some of the specifically black college athletes, um, student athletes, are the overrepresentation in the high revenue producing sports, but also lower graduation rates. Other issues, um, there was a study that was done in uh, the early 1990s, and 20 years later, um, the University of Michigan did another study with student athletes to talk about, um, they wanted to get an, a lot of um, more information about what some of their issues are. And they really mirror what was done 20 years ago. And so um, anxiety, stereotypes by media, faculty, students, others on campus, depression, um, having too many obligations, not being able to effectively manage um, the stress that they're under. And so one of the ways um, that I think, went too far, um, we can begin to look at how we assist uh, those student athletes who are having those issues are to really look at um, cultural competency because I believe that the issues that were pointed out in that study by the University of Michigan um, are student athletes in general but when you add the impact of culture um, and when I talk about culture I'm talking about an inclusive de definition of culture so that includes age, um, gender, disability, ethnicity, race, religion, um, sexual orientation, um, and then also um, when you look at the intersection of socioeconomic status and race, uh, that impounds or impacts the issues of that isolation and, and the anxiety and depression that I talked about earlier. And so one of the ways that I think would be helpful for student athletes is if we um, look at how individuals who are working with them, whether that's coaches, people in student affairs, faculty, administration, um, if there is training that's implemented to help them to better understand the individuals and then how to better effectively um, help them 
with some of the issues that they're facing. There are a lot of um, professional organizations such as the American Counseling Association, the American Psychological Association, and then also the American Association of College and Universities who have developed standards that they believe would be effective for individuals working with students um, that address issues of cultural competency. And so I'm gonna highlight some of those, but what I found in, in my investigation is that most of them cover four principles which I will talk about today. That first principle is awareness of self. Uh, when I do trainings and consultation with universities um, and then also in my classes with my students, the first thing that we talk about is having awareness of self um, and understanding that regardless of who we are, we all have been socialized to believe certain things and have certain attitudes, traditions, and beliefs about other people. And so we all have biases, we all have prejudices. And it's important to recognize that and not think that you're above having those things. Um, that's a struggle for some people. Um, and so the first part of that is looking at um, where did you learn the beliefs, the values, the stereotypes that you learned about other people. And a lot of times that's from your upbringing, from your community. Um, and then you have an experience that sort of either validates what you believe or it contradicts what you believe. The second piece of that is awareness of others. Um, and then it's awareness of others. It's about learning and understanding um, the values and beliefs of other people. Uh, why does a person react a certain way? And until you get to know what's going on with them behind the scenes, it's difficult for you to understand what they're going through. Um, it's often easy for people to criticize the way that a person advocates um, or their activism when you're on the other side. And so it's important to think about what this other person is going through before you start to make judgment, pass judgments on what they're doing. Um, another thing that I think is important is when you have people who are coming from a different background, especially um, young black, black athletes, student athletes who are coming from environments that are uh, low socioeconomic status, it's important that they're working with people who understand their culture and their upbringing. And so one of the questions I have is that people who are working with them in athletics, how often do they expose themselves to the communities that these individuals come from? Are they in the community? Are they working with these students? Um, I used to work with the um, University of Toledo football team um, as a hostess, not what happened in Louisville. This is a very different. Um, and it actually, gear, yes, I have to. Um, I, was, I was an honor student. Um, <laughs> Gary Pinkle was actually the coach at that time, and we would help the coaches recruit the students. Um, and so we worked with the students and their parents when they came in to talk about the culture of the university. And so one of the things they wanted to do is to make sure they had a, a representation of different ethnicities, races, um, and genders to talk to the students and their parents about what was happening on the campus of the University of Toledo. Um, but how often do you have programs where athletics are working with those communities and going into the schools and learning about those people? And that's one way um, to increase that awareness of others. Um, another way, which is the simplest thing you can do is listen. Um, some people um, don't seem to get that concept. And it's interesting, I always do this, this exercise with my students, having them write down, listen, and silent, and look at the letters. They're the same. Um, sometimes you have to be silent to listen, um, to understand what others are talking about, where they're coming from, um, and what they're going through. Uh, and then that third piece um, is understanding what's appropriate for interacting with other people. Um, one thing that you do with, with a certain student athlete may be different than what you do with another. Um, we've talked about equity here before, um, and I think that's important when you're learning what to do. We had a group of students who presented about um, work that was done at a high school, um, and I was one of the presenters there, and this was the session where they were practicing yoga, um, and a lot of those students didn't think that was something they wanted to do until the um, presenter explained the concept of yoga and how it would help them. Um, and so I think it's important to think about what's going to be appropriate for the group that you're working with. And the way that you learn that is through that awareness of others, those principles that I just talked about, listening to them, engaging with them, um, and learning more about who they are and what would be helpful for them. Um, the fourth piece of um, this, which I think sometimes becomes the hardest when I'm doing consultation, people can get that, oh, I understand microaggressions, I understand what my biases are, I'm learning about other people, but when it comes to the action piece, um, it seems to be a struggle. And so 
um, in consultation, uh, people get stuck here all the time. And so I have to sort of put my foot down and say, you've done all that you can do with this awareness of self and awareness of others. It's time for you to, to engage in some action. And I think that it's important to teach not only um, the student athletes about appropriate advocacy, but also uh, those who work with them, how you can be an advocate with them and on behalf of them. Because there are some things that um, in a college environment students may not feel comfortable doing, but you as faculty members, as administration, um, have a larger voice. And one of the things that I think is very important in the, in the consultation work that I've done at universities is that there is, um, support from the executive level. Um, it makes it much easier uh, when you have that. And so this is just a model t that can be presented to um, not only those in athletics, but student athletes about ways to advocate. And so advoca advocacy happens when you're looking at raising awareness, but also when you're looking at political um, advocacy and teaching, um, especially student athletes, about their voice and how there's uh, power in numbers and that they have um, potential to change laws and regulations and policies related to the work that they do. And then finally, because I know my time is getting up, oops, I don't know what I did. I can do that pretty, now I'm just. <laughs> But the last piece of that is really a model for um, advocacy that looks at how do you, um, as an individual who believes maybe there's nothing that I can do, um, really start to look at the um, sort of the stages of advocacy, which starts with identifying that there is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and then also, once you've identified that issue, um, looking around to see who else would be uh, a person who would be interested in um, working with you to address some of those issues, um, organizing that group, formalizing that group, and doing something that I think a lot of people have talked about is looking at research um, and um, statistics that can support whatever it is you're trying to address. Um, but having a clear definition of what the problem is, if you're going to present something to someone, you want to be clear about what the issues are, but also um, provide evidence that this issue is occurring, um, but then come up with some solutions. These are the things that we would like to see happen um, and how those things can happen. And so that action planning is very important uh, where people have specific responsibilities about what you're going to do, who you're going to talk to, um, who are your allies, and what are the asks that you have? What are the things that you want to happen? Um, and then an action and evaluating what you've done. Um, hopefully that leads to some sort of institutional change, but if it does not, then that means start that process all over again um, until that change happens. Thank you. Right, next, we're gonna have a non-traditional approach to facilitate uh, minority athletes a recovery from concussion, and that will be from Medora Frazier from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Let's welcome up Medora. Good morning, everybody. I am Medora Frazier, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Maybe I don't know how to work this. Mm, I might be tough. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, this is a picture of my family. And some things that you notice is my mother is white, my father is black, but I also have six brothers, and I do not have any sisters. My first experience with a concussion involved the two little boys in the blue, um, specifically the one who's actually looking towards you guys. So when we were four and five, they are younger, we decided that we were gonna go down to the basement, we were gonna play this game. And we found a huge cardboard box and we found my late grandfather's golf clubs. Things got interesting. Um, so basically what ended up happening is we played the game where two people get inside the box and one of us would stand outside the box and we would just hit the box repeatedly over and over again. <laughs> and yeah, it's really stupid, really stupid. But we did it, it happened. 
And after 15 minutes of actually playing, my brother Daniel gets out the box. And he was like, my head is wet. And I'm thinking, you're so stupid because there's no water in a box. Like, it's a cardboard box. So when his twin Christian and I turned him around, there was blood running down the back of his head. And all I could think was, is great. Daniel's a snitch. Like, he's definitely telling mom and dad, great. But in my household, having a black father, we had two rules in the house. Snitches get stitches, and no one likes a tattletale. So, and my mom implemented this more than my dad, actually, which is really scary. But this time was different. This time, Daniel knew as a four-year-old his brain was inside his head. And he knew that if he told my parents, we all could die. Like, we all would be in trouble. So Daniel never told, and he did what anybody would do when they get a brain injury. They try to, you know, self-medicate because you don't want anybody to know about it. So Daniel decided to go rinse his head off, and then he put a Band-Aid on it. I don't know why my parents didn't notice, but... Oh, wait. Okay, so there's some stereotypes. So Dr. Adam Waits, Dr. Kelly Hoffman, and Dr. Sophie Chawwater, I hope I said her name right, they conducted this study with, um, or a survey towards white internet users, and they asked them questions ranging from who do you think is most likely to be able to jump from a 30-story building versus who do you think is able to walk the dog, brush their teeth? And the results came back that they believed that a, a black person can easily jump from a 30-story building, but a white person is more capable of doing day-to-day -day activities like walking the dog, which doesn't make any sense because if I could jump, I can walk a dog. And um, this also relates to another study where they conducted a study within a hospital with all races, and they asked them who do they think are less sensitive to pain, and they believe that black people are. Like, black people don't experience the same pain as white people, which makes no sense. Oh, wait, why do I keep going to my family? <laughs> oh, no wonder. Okay. So there's about 10,500 sports-related concussions reported each year, and in the Journal of Athletic Training, they released a study that basically they went into a high school, they asked these high school athletes, what do you know about concussions? Everybody knew what a concussion was, but they found that females would report it more often than males, and men are four to 11 times more likely not to report their concussions. And, but overall, as a student body, nobody wanted to even report it because they didn't see it as that serious. So right now, the concussion management plan for college is that they educate the athletes on what a concussion is. You might tell them, you know, what happens if you don't report one. Um, there's the pre-participation assessment, which involves, like, the balance assessment, cognitive assessment, brain injury history, and symptom evaluation. And then there's the treatment where, like, they take you to the sideline, if, you're, um, if they think you have a concussion, they might have you, you know, memorize a couple of words, come back to you a few minutes later, you don't know it. They might use the finger thing. You know, it's a bunch of different things that they try to do to see where your cognitive function is at. Then they assess, of course, for a C-spine injury because Lord knows we don't want to lose that. And then uh, if you do have a concussion, they limit your physical activity. They tell you to rest your brain, which means no video games, don't go, go outside, play around. Um, they might give you some medication. They tell you to sleep. But the problem is, to be honest, these athletes in college, if I had a concussion, if I was an athlete, I would go to my room, and not me personally, let me not say this part, I will roll a J, I probably will play a video game, I will call some pizza because I need some pizza. Obviously, I can eat junk food. I don't have to play for a week. And then I will probably call somebody's child to come through. That's what ends up happening. Oh. So the first thing that I think we need to do is cultivate the environment. We need to educate the athletes on the dangers of not reporting what a concussion uh, can do to you. Because as we've seen in the media, people do kill themselves. They kill their families. And that's the extreme. But other than that, the day-to-day -day side effects are you're depressed, you're anxious, 
or you don't know what's going to happen because technically you just missed the game, you missed a few practices. Um, so we need to promote an environment that will make this student athlete want to report a concussion. And by doing this, we need to make ourselves as administrators, advisors, faculty, we need to make ourselves uncomfortable to make them comfortable enough to even want to report it. Because I know I'm not going to go report to somebody who's going to judge me. So we need to have a judgment-free zone. Mindfulness. And DJ Khaled is definitely the goat of mindfulness. Mindfulness is the concept of being self-aware. And in that moment, you just focus on what's happening in that moment, whether it's your breathing, your whatever you're thinking about, whatever's going on in your life, you're just in that moment standing there and you're saying, okay, well, I'm feeling this. Why am I feeling this? Or you're listening to what's going on around you and you're focusing and honing in on that sense which can ultimately benefit you through stress uh, if you're experiencing PTSD, anxiety, or depression. And the techniques, I know all athletes do yoga. That's one of those things they make you do before the season starts. Um, meditating, breathing, observing, awareness, listening, immersion in activities, which is actually like if you love to clean your room, clean your room. Like, but clean it, clean it. Like, not just, you know, throw something over the bed, you know, make it look nice. No, clean it. And then uh, appreciation. Oh, well, DJ Khaled does that. Everybody knows DJ Khaled wakes up in the morning. He sees a flower. He sniffs it. He enjoys and appreciates everything that's around him because he's grateful. Uh, the next thing is the anti-inflammatory diet. So they try to get you on this, but the athletes in the room, you guys need to monitor this because eating your omega-3s, like your nuts, your seeds, avocados, white meats, like turkey and chicken and yogurt with probiotics, that will actually help your cognitive function while it's diminishing. Uh, oh, yeah, and they tell you to eat small meals more frequently. Acupuncture and cupping. So acupuncture actually helps with relieving the tension of your headaches, and it can prevent any future migraines. Cupping can relieve any of the soreness that you feel from the impact of the concussion between your neck and your back, and it's proven to work. Sensory deprivation, this is my favorite thing ever. So I'm trying to like dumb this down. Okay, so sensory deprivation, for those who don't know, is you walk into a room, they tell you shower, and you basically get in a tank. And for the rich schools, I know you all can afford one of these tanks, and it would actually help all your athletes. No matter if they're concussed, if they're injured, they're healthy, it doesn't matter what's going on in their lives, that actually works. And what you do is you get in this tank and it's filled with water and salt and the salt allows you to float. And so when you're floating, they take out all the sound. You can't see anything. I mean, you could choose to close it or leave it open. The light stays on in there and you float and it helps you to think and your brain goes into the theta state. And in the theta state, you can retain 300% more information. And in that theta state, it assesses, it assists in healing burnouts, releases um, neurotransmitters. There's an increase of intuition of reality with your subconscious to rewire their brain because you can imagine that if I have a concussion and I'm not playing, I'm starting to doubt myself and who I am and what's going on in my life. And this is important for black people because black people are the hardest on themselves. They don't believe they can do certain things because society is also telling you, like that tweet is coming in saying, oh, he sucks, or oh, why isn't he playing? But you need to rewire your brain to think, I am worthy. I am going to do this. I am going to get back out there, and I am going to be great. Um, and it alleviates any mental blocks. So I want to leave you guys with a quote from Toni Morrison, which is a novelist. She said that when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have power, then your job is to empower somebody else. Let's not leave these superhuman athletes um, with nothing to be empowered about. And, oh, my God, I forgot my final point. Oh, my gosh. Hold on. We're going to think about this one. Let's not leave these athletes. Let's empower our superhuman athletes to be free when their mental health is challenged. Thank you.
All right, our last presenter for session 19 is going to be Tamia Austin from FAMU, and she'll be presenting on Straight from the Horse's Mouth, how HBCU athletes feel about uh, the sickle cell screening. I wrote that down wrong. I'm sorry. Did I get that right? Sickle cell screening. All right, come on up. Let's give Tamia a round of applause. I want you to just point that direction. What's the button? Good morning. So I am Dr. Tamia Austin. Uh, I uh, am privileged to present to you this morning a uh, subject area that is also um, a topic that has become my passion. Um, straight from the horse's mouth, how HBCU athletes feel about the sickle cell screenings. So. The NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, mandated that all schools uh, pre-screen athletes for the sickle cell trait. And this mandate, unfortunately, was more uh, as a result of liability protection than education of our athletes that um, does affect black athletes in particular um, more than any of the other ethnicities that it affects. And I did say that it does affect other ethnicities. In fact, it affects uh, people of African, Asian, Indian, Latin, Italian, Greek, Indian, Turkish descent. So quite frankly, uh, sickle cell trait can affect anyone. Blonde hair, blue eyed, pink skin. It is not just a black uh, disorder. However, we are affected disproportionately. With the mandate, the, the, the athletes have the option to opt out. Uh, there's recent research that shows that the mandate, uh, as far as the screenings go, there's major inconsistencies in how it's implemented across the uh, programs. And even despite the mandate and the um, supposed education that takes, uh, takes place, the deaths uh, that occur as a result of sickle cell trait continue. So what, what brings me to this is that we have an assumption there that education about sickle cell trait is key. So this is a portion of my dissertation research that was uh, a two-phased uh, qualitative and quantitative research where I conducted a census of uh, the athletic department at Florida a University, all of the athletes, all of the coaches, all of the trainers, and a subset of parents. Uh, the census part was a feat in itself, but we were very happy to uh, be able to be in a position to measure their knowledge, beliefs, perceptions about the physical rigor and uh, exertional sickling that is the cause of some of these deaths and or adverse effects associated. The idea was to come to, I did come to the research with the hope to understand what would be needed to uh, create in intervention that would prevent these deaths and also fill knowledge gaps. So uh, using the social ecological model that just helps us to know which level along the social eco ecological model was the best to intervene, we basically found that uh, it was the interpersonal level, dealing with the coaches, dealing with the athletic directors, was the best place to intervene when it came to um, the education that's needed to supplement the trait testing. Basically what I want you to know here is what happens in an exertional event. Uh, it is not widely known, but usually these deaths occur during the first day of conditioning workouts, those conditioning workouts that are happening in February, uh, usually the first day, usually within the first hour, that's when most of the deaths have occurred. And you'll see an athlete that may go as far as not just hands on the hip, not just taking a knee, but they go all the way down to the ground. They may complain of cramping, they may complain of lower uh, flank pain, and it, it is confusing because their own language will say it's a cramp coach. Uh, their own language will say, you know, I've got something going on my back. But it's very quick. So that is why the education of the athletic trainers and 
we'll get to the qualitative data that informed us of what the athletes say they want to know. Uh, this is just in here to show that around this time last year, uh, Oregon um, had six athletes hospitalized for rhabdomyolysis. And rhabdo is an event all in itself, but when associated with sickle cell trait, could also uh, lead to death, which is why this education is so important. But this is a very small subset of student athletes in the NCAA schools that have passed, that have succumbed to exertional sickling. And in particular, uh, Devon Darling, the first one on the end, was a Florida State athlete, uh, February 26, 2001. He was in conditioning. They had just come back from the championship game. Ship game. They'd almost won, uh, playing as true freshmen. And um, he was being groomed in those mat drills to be a leader on the defense. And um, at his funeral, Coach Bobby Bowden said, Devon Darling worked himself to death. Uh, but he passed out multiple times in that conditioning workout. And one of his coaches told him, your body is amazing. You'll pass out before you die. But Devon passed out multiple times and was still being pushed to go through those workouts. And as he would be carried with his teammates uh, through the drills, because if one man fails, the whole team fails. Anybody know what I'm talking about in these conditioning drills? Um, so I have personally devoted myself to educating as many as I can, students, coaches, trainers, parents, um, on the importance of knowing what sickle cell trait is, understanding the difference, so that Devon's death is not in vain. Neither is Dale's, neither is Eric's, Janice, Ted, Eric Gull. And interestingly, Eric Gull was a FAMU athlete that transferred. And on the first day of practice, I believe it was in uh, Shadron State, yeah, he died during conditioning workout. So got to do something. So hence this study, and that's just a few pictures of me uh, talking with the student uh, population, the student athlete population at FAMU. Like I said, this is the phase two portion that I'm talking about today. We did uh, three focus groups of 15 athletes, eight coaches, and eight parents. And this is what the student athletes told us. Um, I don't know much about it. I just know I have it. My mom has it, and it causes my iron to be low. I know it's that it, I know it's predominantly like for you know like black people, African Americans, like it affects African Americans. I've taken multiple different surveys on it, not just yours, but others at my school. Sometimes surveys try to make athletes aware of it, but the only reason I even know about it, I think we had to take a test for a physical, I think. This is what their knowledge was about uh, exertional sickling. Oh, that can make you like pass out, be very exhausted. It definitely affects us athletes in our sports, on the court, on the track, out in the field. So yes, hydration is definitely very important. Another student athlete said, what's that? No, I've never heard of it. When you get tired, it gets worse. Well, to exert yourself, that's like pushing yourself to a certain limit. Um, like they blacked out and they just hit the ground and then you like try to wake them up and they wouldn't wake up. Then you just call the paramedics and like think, I don't know if it's like he didn't have a pulse or anything. And then another said it's like when your blood vessels don't go through your blood stream properly, like don't fit through properly. Um, we asked them about, uh, this This was a question to understand what their knowledge, uh, the, uh, what their appreciation of sickle cell education was. What do they feel about their need for sickle cell education, sickle cell trade education? I don't know if our trainers are educated with stuff like this, but I feel that all trainers should know about sickle cell trait and know how to treat it, what a particular athlete what a particular athlete just know about that, being able to right there like they have the stuff right there with us, like when we're going running and stuff like that. Who should be tested? And this was the, the straight from the horse's mouth because the NCAA mandate, along with the National um, Society of Hematologists, argues that student athletes should not be screened because of the possibility of stigma, the, the possibility of losing a spot, uh, you know, losing playing time and so on. Well, the athletes said, no, not just athletes, 
Just because they're not athletes, they shouldn't be included. They should be included. There are students over this whole campus who are not athletes, but they still work out or they go to the rec room. They still work out, they're walking, they get tired. This is a big campus. It's important for them to know too. The band practices for hours and hours out there in that heat, just like the rest of us. Intramural teams, fraternities, sorors, dance teams, cheerleaders, theater dance teams, everyone college-wide should, uh, should receive this education. And who should be tested? I feel like everybody should be tested. Everybody, because that's your life. I think you have to have a physical like to be able to do anything. I think you should have to be tested for sickle cell trait or disease test. And one athlete said, it's, I'm sorry, one of the coaches said it starts at the top with the president. And this, this was pretty revealing to me. It has to be trickled down because the president has to okay it for the athletic director to even do it or get involved with it. So it has to get emphasis from the top. Um, parents, of course, shared their experiences, but for sake of time, um, one, when we ask how they feel about whether their sickle cell trait status should be disclosed. Should, I mean, I know, you know, we, there's the HIPAA thing, but if you're an athlete yourself, who would you wanna know, who would you tell, do you think you should tell someone? And the student athlete in the uh, underlying text said, I feel like the team should know in case you're in the locker room and something bad happens, you just know the precautionary measures to take. And is sickle cell trait a serious condition? I think it's more serious than people think. Um, yeah. I think it is getting more serious the more cases go on. We had a kid die in Miramar, actually in high school that died. I don't know if it had to do with the sickle cell, but we were out there doing two-a-days for football. So I think the more like stuff, the more awareness people need. Uh, the last student athlete said, if we don't pay attention and take it very seriously, then it can get worse. And can a sickle cell trait athlete, be a sickle cell trait carrier be a good athlete? The student athlete said if they feel like they could be a good athlete or they wouldn't even be, out, be able to comp compete. If he's performing, ain't no judgment for him. If they are performing at the level he's supposed to, that shouldn't affect you in any way. So the bottom line is the student athletes indicated a desire for not only testing and not only education, but for education and testing for the entire student body. Um, they want to, they, and, and they even in, in indicated that it should be shared uh, with them in high school. They should get this information before they come to college. Um, and they express absolutely no threat to the stigma that is reported by um, the CDC and the ASH. So, if this is an indication, I, I take it as an indication that um, we need to educate ourselves, educate the administration, educate our coaches, educate our parents, and educate our student populations about what sickle cell trait is, how it affects athletes, and, and how the exertion and dehydration measures can make these issues worse. Uh, so that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Austin. We're gonna have all of our uh, presenters from this session come up and we've got time for a few questions. So if our presenters wouldn't mind coming back up and we'll get rolling. I see a hand already up, that's good. Testing. Good morning, my question is for Dr. Brackett. Um, I'm right here. You talked about um, advocacy. So yesterday we got a lot of questions about you know, if you're in a position of power, it's easy to advocate. If you're not, you know, threatening to lose your job, what is the best way to advocate when you're not necessarily in a position to advocate? Um, I, I do this a lot with some of the students I work with, but also as a tenured faculty um, with non-tenure, even though I think I was vocal as a non-tenured faculty, I don't know why. Um, but I, I think it's important to 
connect with others who, it goes back to that model that I showed, finding others and identifying others who have sort of the same um, ideas and issues that they want to change, um, and then connecting with those individuals so that you don't feel that you're doing it alone. Um, one of the things that I did with some of my students, um, because we were looking at um, advocating and, and working with some of the senators on Medicare, um, and when they were, as licensed professional counselors, um, identifying issues that they saw in their practice, when they were doing it by themselves, they thought, well, no one's going to want to listen to me, but what we did is doing it as a group. Um, and they saw the power of being able to tell their story because when people get in groups and others understand that I, I'm not just looking at one person, but there are other people who have these issues, but if you have someone who's in a position of power who also is going to support you, I think it makes it easier. And I encourage those who have that um, position of power or have the ear of someone um, that's going to make that decision to be uh, a person who's going to follow through with those um, areas that I talked about, being aware of, of what your status is, but also listening to others and being an advocate and understanding that um, you have uh, sort of a responsibility to make sure that you're um, speaking up for other people. It's not just about you. So hopefully you can um, identify another person who's going to help in that area. Hi. Um, yes, my question is for the lady in the middle about sickle cell. Uh, I was a former track and field athlete, and uh, a couple of my teammates had sickle cell. And as a sprinter, like, they'll have times where they were, like, exhausted or just, like, they would, like, pass out. And I thought it was just being extra. So, like, the girls on the team were like, man, we just got to get them off the team. Like, they're slowing us down. And then, like, I remember my senior year later came out that she had sickle cell, and no one really knew what that meant. Um, and so I guess my question is how – do you educate, I understand like the privacy and you know, is there, is there a um, right to disclose it? But it's just like, I feel like we probably gave that girl hell because I was just like, man, you are like slowing us down. You supposed to be on anchor. You supposed to be on the, on the relay and you're slowing us down. And so it's just like, I feel like it's very important to educate the student body um, and the athletes that surround it because then looking like, after like I said, my senior year, then I felt bad because I was just like, I didn't know. I just thought she was just being extra. <laughs> and you are not alone, unfortunately. So there's a concept that uh, we call uh, universal uh, education, universal prevention. Uh, if you think about October, can anybody in here tell me what October is? Breast cancer. And we see pink tennis shoes, pink fire trucks. The NFL is playing with pink gloves. Everybody does not have breast cancer. Everyone's not going to get breast, uh, breast cancer, but everyone's being educated about it. So someone said, uh, day before yesterday, I think it was, uh, have a dream so big you really need divine intervention to accomplish it. I have the nerve to dream that um, I will be a part of something that will make sickle cell trait what the American Cancer Society is one day, where everyone knows what it is, everyone is not affected by it, and but we can rattle off just a few things. The difference between sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease, because that's the start. People say they had sickle cell. Okay, what? Sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease? There is a difference. Um, they, the three risk factors, hydration, dehydration, and elevation. So if you are an athlete and you're working out, you need to hydrate before, during, and after. And if you... Um, are going to exert, you have to be allowed to slowly work up to it. You have to warm up. You cannot just go hard immediately, especially if you've been off for a while. And you need to be allowed uh, recovery breaks, hydration breaks. Everyone needs to take a knee. So if you don't want to single anyone out, then make everyone take a break. Uh, using the US military's example, if the temperature is a certain temperature, if they're going to be wearing a certain amount of gear, and they're going to be doing a certain you know, level of activity, then they already know we're going to break every 20 minutes, everyone's going to take this amount of hydration, and then we'll reconvene. And so those breaks, that's one example. And there are some best, pra best practices out there, but that way if the entire team is educated, starting with the, you know, the coaches uh, and the trainers, and no one needs to be singled out, um, but if a, if, if a coach, if, if a student athlete has asthma, 
are they going to be allowed to take their pump? Are they? Then if you know, it for me it's a no-brainer. But that is that that your student athletes are acting that way because they don't know. They they are not aware and and unfortunately, that person with sickle cell probably isn't aware of, isn't aware either. Monique, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Monique A.J. Smith, owner of uh, Caesar Empowerment. Uh, did you present your findings to the president and the board of directors for Florida a and I have not yet. There you go. Because it ties together with the, with the advocacy. You got to find other like-minded individuals, and I can believe if you do that, you can go from Florida a and Florida a and FAMU. Yes, FAMU. <laughs> MEAC, and go from there. I got one more question. You can go. This one's for Caroline Brackett. Uh, you mentioned earlier that we need to have more competence in social justice training and practice. When we think about it at the systems level, how do you see that being implemented, and what are some ways that if a university or organization decides that they want to make this training, what are, what are some things they can do? Uh, I actually, um, I, there are several consultants out there and consulting firms that do that. Um, I have, uh, first I think identifying who you want to bring on campus. Um, I've done some consultation for um, universities um, in natural resources and environment, which I know nothing about, um, but they're um, working in their profession to increase diversity. And so um, for me going in, it was about uh, teaching those principles first, what's going on in your campus, doing a needs assessment, speaking to the students, speaking to the faculty, speaking to administration. And so um, in that particular situation, it, there was executive level um, support. And so I was meeting with the provost, and so I was meeting with people across campus. And one of the things that I found is that a lot of times there was just, they weren't communicating with one another. And so I do think that there are um, diversity consultants throughout the United States who would love to come into a college environment and, and sort of look at what's going on there, but then also having trainings. And so I did the trainings um, and workshops, which were experiential that looked at awareness of self and awareness of others, and then looking at, well, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, talking about microaggressions um, and things that are happening. And so one of the things from anecdotal feedback from faculty and students is that the conversations were being had after those presentations. And so I would, I would start with looking at consultants. Um, sometimes there are listservs out there, but just speaking to others about people who have come to campus or um, who are out in the community either doing research or um, uh, speaking engagements about diversity. Um, and I believe that a lot of those consultants would love to come and do something related to um, cultural competency. But I also think it's important that they have an understanding um, of the culture of athletics if they're going to work with um, the college athletics environment. Um, and so that would be very important. So um, making sure they understand the culture that they're coming to. All right, let's give our panelists a round of applause, please. All right, we're going to take a break to uh, give our, our special session a chance to get set up. We're going to come back and we'll resume at 925. We'll resume at 925. Thank you.
going to show a small snippet profiling one of our graduate assistants, Devin Walker, and this is going to be a part of a larger project where we detail what the African American Male Research Initiative at the University of Texas at Austin looks like. So, Jason, go ahead and roll the video. I think growing up in Los Angeles, especially being mixed and being in a really mixed city, it was challenging to find out for me what it truly meant to be black. And I think sports was a big part of that for myself because most of the kids who were good in sports were black. Um, so for me, in one way, it was a way to tap into that, tap into my blackness. Once I gave up my athletic career, totally disrupted me. Who am I, not only in America, but in this world, right? What do I represent? Once I got into the University of Texas, I reached out to Dr. Harrison. Um, we talked to him about my interest in studying athletic identity. We had a great conversation. I got admitted. I got zero dollars. So I reached out to Dr. Harrison, and he told me to reach out to Dr. Moore. I was in Asia at the time, so Dr. Moore, we struggled getting a conversation because the time was so different. He was like, call me back during this time. I'm like, I can't, Dr. Moore. I'm going to be backpacking in Vietnam. And once he heard me say that, he's like, wait, what? He's like, all right, man. You good. I got a job for you. I'm like, all right. was working with the Longhorn Center for Academic Excellence, TA for one of Dr. Moore's courses, and then working with Amory helped to promote this idea of international education for students of color. You you are a former athlete, right? You worked with athletes. Yeah. You can even your own like there's elements of this that I feel like measuring a, a aspect of foreclosure. Not just the identity, yeah. it's like the reliance on it. It makes a lot more sense to me now. So I've been trying to figure out, because it, it, it's very narrow. The, yeah. scope, the, scope, the scope is very narrow, right? So I, I was kind of, I didn't know what it was, but I think you putting, putting it that way makes a lot more sense to me now. That's why you're a teacher, man. That's why you're going to be a doctor someday. <laughs> one day. One day. Appreciate well, yeah, you were in my class. I don't even think of, honestly, I don't even think about the fact that you're in my class. Just more like, come on, man, share the knowledge. Yeah. Having my peers be PhD students, PhD candidates, um, that was super motivating. To read their work, to see how they're going through the process, to see them get better, also made me realize, oh, I can get better, right? It's a process. And I think that's the best thing about being in community with so many other black graduate students is that you realize it's a process. And you could doubt yourself if you only want to look at yourself where you're at. But once you realize, like, all right, this person was here too, and they, look how much growth they've had, um, I'm going to have the same amount of growth. <laughs> Liberating our mind is understanding the heterogeneity of blackness, which means that black people are not just this one thing, and that we need to redefine blackness for ourselves. Oh, because uh, 
I think my purpose, educate to uh, influence, to motivate people to step outside what they think is possible for themselves. Thank you, man. Have a good break. Thank you, too. All right. Happy New Year. All right. I like when you let the hair out. Cheers. That's good. There's diversity within myself, and there's different aspects of my identity that I can pull out depending on the context in which I'm in. I'm motivated both by you know, what I see in front of me, the leaders that have come before me, but also how far we have to go. Right. We're now going to kick off session 20, which is our second special session. And we're talking about a topic I, that I happen to be a big fan of. We're not just keeping them eligible, a conversation about academic support. And that's going to be uh, facilitated by uh, Ken Miles from LSU. So let's give future Dr. Ken Miles a round of applause, please. Good morning, everybody couple things I'm going to put out there. One, things that I'm passionate about. I have a tendency to talk fast sometimes. Voice gets a little deeper. And I start to sweat profusely. That's one. The other part, I reminded our attendants here a few years ago. I said, I know you realize that there are four Gospels in the Bible, but there's one more that you've forgotten, and it's Kenneth Miles. One of the things that I challenge students, educators, is understanding what it is to be the best me. And so in doing so, there are several ways that I'm able to get that accomplished. Something I want you to remember is that success happens by design. It is not accidental. One of the reasons why Dr. Moore wanted me to actually share with you uh, some stories and some experiences, because during my time when I got to LSU in 2008, the graduation success rate for our student athletes was 69%. 2017, it's 90%. <laughs> Happens by design, it's not accidental. So the journey starts with myself. One of the things that I believe in that in order to become the product that you want to see, you have to be reflective in your practice, which means that every single day at the end of the day, I'm with every wine and everything in my head to say, did I make the best decisions? Did I make the right choices? Is there anything different that I would do in order to be great? I say, damn, being good, understand what it means to be great. And so that translates into where theory and practice intersects. For myself, there are four principles of leadership that I end up using as guiding points, one of which is being visionary, the other is being servant, the other is being authentic, and the last one being adaptive. I look at those as the four cornerstones because one, I cannot do the same thing and expect a different result. I have to be able to think outside the box to get the results that I want. In order to go from 69 to 90, we had to think outside the box. So here's what that looks like. When you look at the rest of our teams, okay, you'll get a good understanding of what this means. Baseball, 2008 was 45%. 95%, 50% increase. Men's basketball, 40%, 82% currently, a 42% increase. Football, 54% to 78%, a 24% increase. Men's golf, 83% to 100%. Swimming and diving, men, 73 to 96%, a 23% increase. 
Men's tennis brought their A game back then and now, 100% to 100%. Men's track from 75% to 77. Women's basketball from 70% on 70 to 93%. Women's golf, 71% to 100%. Women's gymnastics, 83% to 93%. Women's soccer, 82% to 95%. Softball, 71% to 88%. Women swimming and diving, 89% to 95%. Women's tennis, 75% to 100%. Women's track, 72% to 96%. Volleyball brought their A game from 100 to 100. We are Kipling. The strength of the wolf is the pack. The strength of the pack is the wolf. I recognize that this cannot happen by Kenneth Miles alone. There are the collective efforts and relationships that allow this to happen. I'm very fortunate to have the support of our athletic department. I'm very fortunate to have the support of the Tiger Athletic Foundation. And I'm very fortunate to have the support of academic affairs. The combination of all three allow me to be able to do the things necessary to get to where we want to be. So when looking at people, I talked about adaptive leadership. Adaptive leadership basically lives below the, below the uh, neckline. And essentially what it says is that I'm hiring people of like heart, not of like mind, but of like heart. People have selective memory, right? Not of like mind. Somebody does something wrong, you teach them how to do it right, but they can have a choice into doing that. Your heart is who you are. It's nothing that I need to teach. So if everyone is indoctrinated in the same commitment and passion, ultimately the success, the success is going to end up happening. So I'm like a coach in that I end up recruiting long before they're ready to graduate. And so when I'm bringing people into our organization, these are people that I already know that are indoctrinated with the same commitment and passion that I am. The collective voice, the collective responsibility, the collective knowledge and wisdom of others allow us to get to where we want to be. That does mean that I increased the staff size, but it was based on data-driven numbers. I said in order to better service our students, we've got to understand what best practices are in order to be able to provide the attention that's needed to get it done. My background is higher ed, so it's very simple for me to say looking at the academic integration plus the social integration is going to increase the likelihood of retaining a student, thus ultimately increasing graduation rates. That's the basic premise. And moving forward and understanding how we get there from the journey of leadership, being a reflective practitioner, I got to understand the effectiveness of the people that I have. Even though I understand that they are of like heart, I got to understand how they will function in a team atmosphere. So there are two things that I actually do with all of my staff, including graduate assistants. We do the DISC and we do the EQ. And so my joke is, that's it. the lowest score I got on the EQ is social awareness. It's about an 86, so that means that if you're having a rough day and you're coming to me for something, understand that you still might get kicked. But the reality is that now you have an understanding of who I am and how to be able to get the things that you need in order to accomplish the goals. Okay? Moving forward, there's the execution piece, which is a strategic plan. What I end up doing is challenging my folks to understand that if you want to be the greatest of all time, you got to understand that there's certain things that you must do. A strategic plan is a must. Our vision is to be the premier provider of transformative student athlete support services. Here's what that means, that every time they enter our facility, they leave better than when they came. Academically, they grow from freshman to sophomore, junior to senior. Mentally, they grow from being impulsive thinkers to critical thinkers. Professionally, they've had the experience of understanding resume writing, cover letter writing, LinkedIn profile, mock interviews. 
All of these things become critical ingredients to the growth and development of our students, which leads to our motto, enter to learn, leave to serve, understanding the moral responsibility of giving back. It's like when I explain to them the definition of what it means to be wealthy, because most people talk about, I want to be rich. I said, rich is temporary, wealth is sustainability. And it goes from generation to generation. And what I'm educating you on are things that's going to have the same rippling impact with your own family. Coming from the state of Louisiana, it's an interesting place. Love it for its food, I tell you. I went in, I think I was 100 pounds lighter. <laughs> yep, blood pressure and everything went up. And they're talking about eating in moderation. But it's a very poor state. So when you look at poverty, I mean, you're talking about being 48th or 49th, right? And that's including Washington, D.C. When you start to look at the wage uh, within the state, talk about average 42.5 with two parents, four kids, which means each parent is averaging about $21,000 a year. When you look at sheer numbers, above the age of 24, roughly 75% of the folks do not have degrees. When talking about employment opportunity, most of the jobs that are created within the state are entry level jobs, menial jobs, which I'm not saying anything is wrong with it, but they're also the first ones that get cut. So I train our folks to think about things in a way that if education is your only way to be able to get out of where you're coming from, then maximize on the opportunity. Not all necessarily buy into it, because on the flip side, there was a time when you looked at the state of Louisiana, and per capita in the NFL, most folks were from the state of Louisiana, out of the entire country. But the reality is, is that I said NFL stands for not for long, and you gotta understand that you still need to be able to have a plan to take care of your family to change the outcome, okay? So, recognizing that education becomes that weapon, if you will, I remind them of Nelson Mandela's quote, that education is the most powerful weapon to be able to change the world and understand that it starts for you right now. Next part of that, our mission. Essentially to be able to help our young men and women find balance between academic achievement and their, uh, being able to operate at an optimal level with their personal development. We try not to have any imbalances. I get our folks to understand the values that you bring to the table. I have them plastered throughout our facility. I'm a fan of the pop art period and basically doing pop art it's noted that repetition signified importance. So when you saw Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe's, you saw several of them because it was a popular icon of the day. Same with the soup Campbell cans. So I do the same with our values. You will see teamwork spread throughout the facility. You will see diversity spread throughout the facility. You will see education, you will see service, you will see accountability. So it serves as great reminders and cheaters for you. So when a company interviews you and say, what is it that you bring to the table? You already got an upper hand on most folks. Then we get into the goals. First goal, to graduate our student athletes. Second, prepare them for life after college. Third, promote and preserve the integrity of our program. Fourth, for me, our team to be able to support one another with professional development opportunities so that we train ourselves to be able to put the mask on us first before we can actually help our student athletes. Mm -hmm. Success happens by design. It is not accidental. These are the things that we remind our folks. I'll be the first to tell you, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do because one, what I'm doing is I'm changing a culture. The other thing that I'm doing is I'm raising a level of expectations. But again, I recognize too that these are relation building opportunities. One of the things that's tough for a visionary leader is for those who are not visionary to be able to see the picture that's being painted. So constantly, I have to be able to change the photo so that I can get the meaning that I want across to everyone else. I say that because again, there are several challenges, even with the growth of 90%, where of course you have others who still can tell you how to do your job. The reality is that I like to say that I use experience, theory, and practice to be able to formulate the decisions that are being made to be able to put us forward. With that, I think I'm gonna turn the floor over for questions. 
I recognize that the best relationships have to do with short speeches. Certainly. So I guess the first thing that I would end up doing is telling them to come to an event like this, first and foremost. Um, the other part to that, I'm a member of the 100 black men of Baton Rouge. <laughs> and there's a motto that basically says they will be what they see. There are some stories that, or some parables that only I can deliver. And the reality is, is that you may not necessarily want others to be able to deliver it. And so if you plan to be able to have a program that's going to operate at a maximum capacity, it behooves you to be able to have some folks that look like them. I'm not stating that they are not capable of getting the job done. What I'm saying is that recognizing the diversity of your your student population, you got to be a little bit more inclusive in your approach in hiring folks that's going to end up having the same commitment and passion to be able to help them. Many times you're dealing with some young men, in particular, I'm going to say young black men, who are raised in single parent households. I was one of those men. And I think it'd be great to be able to have a relationship, as we know the research already tells us, that a person is likely to stay based on the relationships that they form while they're in college. So whether it be a staff member or faculty member, there are only things that perhaps another black man can tell me about what it's like to be able to grow up and be a young black man and being able to be able, um, be able to become that best person that they can be. So my recommendation, one, seek professional development opportunities that's going to educate them on the cultural competencies that are needed to do their job. Two, encourage departments, whether or not they're under the structure of academic affairs or athletics, to be able to diversify their staff so that it becomes representative of their student athlete population. The school has no money, losing faculty members, Mm -hmm. The library is not purchasing new books. Academic programs are being shut down. But about a month ago, you all gave a defensive coordinator a $10 million deal for four years. So what is it like when you meet with the people on the academic side of the house, and how do you manage those relationships when they are losing academic resources, but you're giving a defensive coordinator two and a half uh, per year for four years? One, I'm reminding them we're under academic affairs, too, so I feel their pain. <laughs> You know, it's a difficult conversation, you know, quite frankly, to be able to have. I am fortunate enough that I have a great rapport across the university. And so one of the things that I mentioned, how things happen by design, when I first got there, I ended up creating the relationships with folks across campus in various leadership roles, all the way down to the coordinators who do the day-to-day -day operations. So there were times when I had meetings with all the deans, there was meetings that I had with all the associate deans. There was meetings that I had with the advisors. 
There was meetings that I had with student affairs. There was meetings that I had with facilities and understanding the bigger picture of things. Again, I think it's a very difficult conversation to be able to have with some folks, particularly when they've committed their lives to educating and research. Um, I know the notion that's often being uh, shared is that it is market value. Um, I often note that market value is what one is willing to pay and not necessarily what everyone else is paying. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it's very difficult. Uh, I really don't, I, I could have never predicted this 20 years ago, the power or the impact of athletics on an institution. I just, I just couldn't, I, I never did see it that way. But in that, what I do do is I try to also, where there's opportunities to be able to share resources, I do. John Singer, Texas A&M. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, when I was a grad student, one of the academic advisors at the institution I was at said, this kind of position is difficult because on the one hand, my mission is student development, but my boss's uh, focus is commercial development. So how do you, what advice do you give to some of the young and up and coming uh, people who want to work in your, your area if that particular divide is there, or if it's true, what's, what this yeah. particular counselor was saying. There's two things that I often remind folks in this profession. You're always gonna be overworked, and you're always gonna be underpaid. The folks who are true educators, in all honesty, when you think about it, we are wired differently. We would do the same amount of work, whether we pay you $1 or $100. It would behoove us to know that others know that about us. Hence, the value of what we do is very significant, but it may not necessarily translate on the dollar side. It doesn't mean that you're not value. It's noting market value, right? It's a, it's a rhetorical question that has to be answered at some point in time when you're looking at those who are educating for a lifetime versus those who are preparing for a game. It doesn't mean that that game is not catapulting and changing their life because that's what athletics was for me. It was an opportunity to be able to do some things that I could not afford and essentially getting our young men and women to recognize the same things. Uh, Dr. Raphael here for um, a question. So you mentioned the DISC profile and the EQ assessment that you use. You also mentioned sustainability and strategic planning. Yes. Can you elaborate on how, I know that um, especially at our campus, we do some of these assessments and it's sort of like a flash in the pan and then we never touch them again. Can you explain to me how um, you have incorporated this and how you use it in a sustainable way? Um, and like, do you do multiple assessments? Do you put it into your strategic plan? Anything like that? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I did is I paired up with HR. So I had them come in and actually give the assessments. I also had them come in and provide the feedback. I also asked them to give scenarios to be able to show how this can be impactful in our work. So understanding where your boss may fall on a DISC assessment, for example, you know, if they're going to be dominant or if they're gonna be conscientious to know what it is that they're actually looking for. One of the things about the work that we do, of course, is very hectic. Um, it is like Groundhog, Groundhog Day in the sense that some things are very cyclical, um, but it is an intentional step. Initially when we did it, you're right, we did it, everybody understood it, thought it was great, put it away. I'm intentional on bringing it back and say, okay, now, did you take a look at the assessment so that you understand the tendencies of your supervisor? And I go the other way, too. I have many folks who are aspiring to become directors, and I said, these are some of the things that you need to understand. The most difficult thing within my job is managing people. Just because you can get anything on any given day, because we're influenced by many things. And so for me, I have to be this steady ship to be able to get people to come back to the goals that we're trying to get at hand. So that's one of the ways of just being intentional about it and talking about it. 
Um, one of the things that I can share with you that happened so that we can operationalize some of these things is that my entire team did two things. First of which they created a charter statement, okay, in which everybody signed off on. The other thing is that they told me what's important to the organization. So the three areas essentially was organization, so like organizational structure, organization, uh, how we function as a team. The second one was looking at the internal processes of what we do, and the third was professional development. Every member of my staff is a member of one of the three of those teams. Those three teams essentially execute the strategic plan. I do have a version of the strategic plan that's noted through my LinkedIn page on Link, uh, link Share, which you're more than well slide share, excuse me, which you're more than welcome to take a look at. The quantitative data piece is not necessarily a part of that, but you do get a good idea of how we're able to go through our goals, our objectives, and our strategies towards achieving those things. So one is just simply being intentional and bringing it back. Uh, within our meetings. There was a second part to your question that I'm thinking I might be missing. Yes. Certainly. Uh, I had mentioned about recruitment earlier. So I'm intentional about the recruitment of who I bring in. Targeted searches. Um, doesn't mean that I'm sacrificing them. Uh, the quality of the process or the, or the uh, credentials of the candidates by doing so. I pay attention to what people are doing across the country. And so what I remind folks again, I said I'm just like a coach. I have people in my office that came from Loyola, Maryland, came from Maryland, have experiences also at Rutgers, Temple, uh, the last person I brought in, Kentucky, Arkansas, Florida, Again, it's understanding individuals who have that same like heart, but also meeting what's needed for our uh, young population. And so if I'm going to go back to the notion of they'll be what they see, I make an intent on finding people that's going to end up fitting that area. So question here, uh, Dr. Angel Brutus to your left. Uh, one quick question, in terms of a lot of the talk has been surrounding the organizational structure, uh, what you do for your employees. I'm very interested to learn more about how this has a trickle down effect to the actual experience of the student athlete. Like how are you uh, ensuring that all of these things that you're placing in, in your administration, how is this impacting truthfully the athlete experience when you talked about relationships we know that time is a commodity for, commodity for a lot of these students. Mm -hmm. um, how do you ensure that these relationships are being nourished in a, a meaningful way in spite of the barriers of time commitments? Understood. Well, I think one of the things I remind folks is the hours of operation, noting that it's not like I have a third shift office. I have individuals that are expected to work in the evenings, work on the weekends, and I said that demonstrating what their commitment is with you. I said in some instances, I have folks that care more about you and your academic investment than you do. So the reality is, is that we go through some real harsh conversations for those individuals who are narrow-minded okay. and thinking that their athletics may be the only way to be able to get out. I'm not necessarily saying I'm going to bust one's dreams, but I am saying I'm a realist in, in understanding, okay, so let's say you do have an opportunity to go. Now. If you have an opportunity to go, what are you going to do with it? The goal is to be able to get the second contract, not the first. We already know that the average of folks within the league, and I'm going back to NFL, and it's just a you know, small population I'm looking at with football, because that's where a tendency, where a lot of things have a tendency to influence our young men. I said, most folks get cut before three years, and I said, you know why? I said, the reality is, is that you don't get any pension for a lifetime. So if you get cut at two years, seven months, and every in, uh, organization gets the transaction sheet, recognizing that you got cut, what's the likelihood of you actually getting picked up? I said, with well, folks talking about they retired, I said, no, they got fired. There's a, there's a difference. 
And what I would say with that is that, so some don't get it while we're there. They get it later. Once they get to the organization, they understand the business of the organization. Then they know that when their friends get cut, and then when they get cut, and many come back. We do have a program called Project Graduation, which basically knows for those individuals who basically left in good standing, have an opportunity to be able to come back, which we will pay for and cover, just like they were still student athletes. So they get tutoring, they get mentoring, they get any kind of assistance that they need, and we provide it. I can't, I can't fault someone for not taking the opportunity. I get that. The way our society has an emphasis on capitalism, it is a once in a lifetime shot. But what I do remind them of is that it's better to have choices than to not have any at all. So with that being stated, some get it, some don't. I can wish I could say all of them do, but that's just not the case. I can note 15 years later, I got an apology from a student. Students said, I know I was just a bad apple. I know I caused you headaches. I said, here's the reality. Learning is a lifetime. I'm happy to see that you're doing well. Speaking of life after college, Ken, by the way, your results of graduation rates with your students is extremely impressive. But thinking about the college to career path after graduation, could you share with us your ideas, your vision, and implementation strategies on getting them to that career where they feel mm -hmm. certainly successful, but yep. also fulfilled? Understood. Um, one of the things that I did not share, some of you may know, I was an art major. And one of the things that I know that art does, it allows you to be able to create a masterpiece. That's the way I look at our students. You know, I have the ability to be able to shape, mold, form a masterpiece. So with that being stated, I believe in the power of imagery. We have a painting, most recent painting that was done um, by a former student athlete. It has many of our alums, many notable ones, standing in their cap and gown with their stole on, which looks like on marble steps with the background of the university and various occupations behind them. What it does essentially is that it welcomes them to the university, recognizing that once they're there, any of these things is possible. And then, looking back, your obligation to be able to give back. There's a small quote on there that I have. I used to share with our recruits, I said, how many of you believe in the ABCs? I said, well, I believe in the CBAs. Conceive it, believe it, achieve it. The reality is that many of them, I think, just don't really know what it is they want to do. And so when I shared that I was an art major, I said, I didn't go to college playing on majoring in art. I went into college to get an education, and it just so happens that I end up becoming an art major. It becomes the opportunity to be able to learn your likes and dislikes. Because many of them say, I want to be a coach. I said, okay, nothing wrong with that. I said, so understand you're going to be a teacher. No, I'm just going to be a coach. I said, you understand, a coach is a teacher. <laughs> I said, there are certain things that you're going to have to take in in order to be able to get there. And so part of them is walking that you know, tight rope with them. Some of them, it happens when they decide to come back through project graduation. Uh, some happen when they realize that Injuries can happen at any moment in time. Things can happen within their family at any moments in time. And then just simply making it an emphasis. We place an emphasis on it. Again, what I would know too when I talk about choice, I said it's the most powerful word in the dictionary. I said a one syllable word so powerful that you can go left or right. Same people grow up in the same household, get fed the same food. One gets larger and the other one gets smaller. And so the reality is, is that just like any other students, you know, it's kind of navigating, figuring it out. And the goal is to be able to get them to be more specific. For those who say they want to own their own business, they say, great, what do you want to own your business in? I don't know. I said, well, right now it's still a wish, right? Go back to the drawing board. Let's come back and talk about it. I said, the only way for you to be able to own your own business, you got to be intentional enough to know what it is that you want to be over or have oversight over. 
So that is the goal, certainly. Um, in terms of measurements on it, one of the things I know that was an emphasis on the Obama administration is looking at career placement, which I knew translated down to higher institutions, tracking some of those things. They are doing a good job of it, um, but I can tell you that they need help. And for us, we've uh, kind of kept an informal track of where our folks go, and it lands all over the place from graduate schools to uh, working in for-profit businesses as well as some non-for-profits. All right, let's give doc future Dr. Miles a round of applause, please. All right, I'm gonna have Chris come up real quick uh, to kind of talk through uh, the survey real quick. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on, a little more energy. All right. I am so excited. It's Friday. Um, but you guys all had a great time. You had a great time. Let me make some noise for me. Come on, come on. So while we're setting this up, we want to know um, what we can do to make this conference or the summit better. A lot of you guys don't realize next year is our fifth year. That's huge. It's our fifth year. So going into that, we want to get some feedback, some information that can uh, help us, you know, continue to make this grow, get some more people here, and also make sure that you're having a great time and you're creating uh, networks and connections that are going to last for a while. So what we have here is a QPR code. You can take your phone out. If your iPhone is updated, uh, it's probably slower. but we can go ahead and uh, go ahead and scan that with your camera. Just put your camera on there, and it'll scan. It'll go right to the survey. If you don't have an iPhone, but you have Snapchat, on my Snapchatters, take your Snapchat out, hold it over it. It'll go right to the survey. If you don't have Snapchat or an iPhone, we're sending out an email. So the email should go out to your phone right now. So if you don't have either of those, <laughs> click your email and fill out the survey. It's going to go right to the survey, huh? I appreciate you. So email's out, we're good. Jay, can we make it a little bit bigger, if possible? For everybody in the back row, is it working? Huh? There we go, let's try it now. Huh? Appreciate it. <laughs> it's not working for you? I can get you a paper survey before you leave. I mean, we can do it however you want. All right? The, e the email just went out also. You should have an email in your inbox with a link to the survey. So if anybody's having an issue with getting it off the board, check your email. The survey will take you less than three minutes. It'll help us continue to make this experience that you have in Austin, Texas, a wonderful experience. Um, we're so happy. Thank you to our sponsors, the Ross Group, um, Texas Rain and also the College Athlete Magazine. Without those sponsors, we couldn't make this possible. So um, we are looking forward to having you all here next year. Uh, thank you so much. If there's anybody who has an issue with the survey, anybody? Raise a hand. Everybody has a survey? Everybody's doing it? Fantastic. I'm going to pass it back over to Brandon. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> there we go. All right. For those of you, while, while you all are filling out the survey, I'm going to bring up Alexander Williams from Texas Reigns. He's one of our sponsors. I wanted to give him an opportunity to kind of talk about what he does and just give you all an opportunity to kind of hear from him uh, what Texas Reigns is all about. So, Alexander, would you go ahead and come on up? And, and for those of you not doing the survey, he give Alexander a warm round of sound as he comes, this, comes forward. Nice to see everyone. Good morning. Come on, you guys got to get live than that. Good morning. I want to thank the entire conference, especially Chris, Dr. Moore, uh, uh, every, the entire staff. I'm just happy, overwhelmed to be here and to provide what I have to, uh, to my people, bottom line. Um, I consider myself a socialpreneur. Uh, and being a socialpreneur is someone who looks into the community to see the need and actually go out, fill a need, and make sure that it happens. And for me, I can remember growing up, uh, my grandmother used to go out and collect a bucket you know, with the rainwater and dump it on the plants. And when it falls on the plants, the plants come back and it's live. If you guys ever think when you're driving and it rains, and after it rains, the sun comes out and you look around, everything is vibrant, green, beautiful, wonderful. So then I said, dang, wow, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, 
Then I thought about the crises that are happening around the world, especially in Flint, Michigan, East Indiana, Chicago, East Chicago, Indiana, sorry, uh, Washington, D.C., and the list goes on and on. The crumbling infrastructure of the United States is what's happening. And I looked at that and I said, oh, another crisis. Hurricane Katrina, Harvey, Haiti, all of these places, it took the governments more than a week to get people water. In cases like Haiti, they started to go into the wells and get water, and now they have a waterborne disease, cholera, and people are dying. I looked around and I said, dang, Hurricane Katrina, three days without water, rioting, looting. Wow, Harvey, all of the water devastation that happened. I said, wow, the solution is, is here. The solution is rainwater capturing. This is a completely new industry. We're one of six in the world. I'm the only one, the only black man in this industry. It really makes me sad, but I'm a solution. And the reason I'm a solution is because you guys have been drinking this water, and I want to do a taste test. I want to take four people from the audience and come up, and my time is short, and I'll make sure I, I put it in there. My man right here, just raise his hand. Someone from this section. Right here with the beard, like my man. Ma'am, right here. And the lady in the back with the hair. If you guys can come up, and let's do a taste test real quick. But I'm also going to fill you in on, on a couple of... Uh, a couple of statistics. Again, in a crisis, you guys just sit here and there's a cups of water and just, we're gonna do a taste test on all of that. Um, in a crisis, uh, again, that spawned this idea. So my wife was diagnosed with lupus at 16. She, before becoming a medical doctor, she suffered, right? And when we met, she was on all of these medications and the whole nine, and I was like, what are you doing? What are you on these things for? Let's get back to nature. Let's get back to what our people are. We are part of the earth. We're made up of the same elements. Let's get back there. And she went on her journey from becoming a, uh, a completely industry-driven doctor to a holistic doctor, and she cured her lupus. So out of that, we moved to Austin. I'm from New York. We moved to Austin five years ago, and there was no foundation for lupus here in Austin. So we created the, the Lupus Walk in Austin. And I was searching for a company to say, hey, we need some fresh, clean water. That's the only way our people can get better and healthy. So I searched and searched and searched, couldn't find it. Lo and behold, I found a company, Texas Rain. Walked in, mom and pop, Dave and Corman, loved those people. And they sponsored the event. And the patients, the people who had lupus after drinking the water, I noticed the difference. And I said, wait a minute, I got to get into this again. So I grabbed, grabbed them up, set them down, and said, hey, with my experience, with my expertise, my people need this, and I want it. We worked out a deal, bought into the company. Lo and behold, I own the company. And from there... Uh, there's so many benefits to this water, but in reality, it's about humanity. It's about making people better. And one of the ways I want to do that is to start with my water. So if you guys can take a cup. Each one of you take a cup real quick. So we got smart water. I'm doing a taste comparison now. So we got smart water. And we have Aquafina. And we have Texas Rain. So you guys crack that open. Take a taste, pass it around, take a taste, pass it around and take a taste. All right, come back. So you guys taste that, it's pretty, pretty good, right? And basically all these waters, guys, and I'm gonna educate you a little bit, all of these waters are, are, are the same except for mine. And the reason they are because they all come from a municipality. My company is a municipality, we're actually governed by the state of Texas and also by the federal government. So I am a water treatment facility. Yeah, now you guys can take taste Texas rain. Now you guys have had the water throughout the conference and there's much, much more I need to go into and I'm jumping all over the place because I'm just so excited, but that's the reality. 
And another reason I got involved in this company, not only for the health benefits, but also for the jobs that can be created for our people. Up and down the supply chain, from distributors to licenses to marketing to administration, everything. We can supply our entire communities with this. We can supply our cities with this. And this is something that has been around for centuries. Just taking that technology and making it anew. So I want you guys' honest opinion of which bottle of water you're going to buy from now on. Texas rain. Texas rain. Texas Why? Rain. Why? It's smoother. It's what? Smoother. Smooth? Mm -hmm. Okay. What about you, my friend? It's fresher. It's fresher? Yeah, it, it, it's smoother. I feel like I'm in a Ciroc commercial right now. But <laughs> <laughs> well, y'all don't want me in a Ciroc commercial. It, it just tasted like you were tasting something fresh, clean, and, and vibrant. Thank you very much. So I, 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 I do that. I do that. Thank you guys for participating. And drink all you want, please. Um, and the, the, the reason I did that is because taste, you know, the proof is in the pudding. And the pudding, however, is... Uh, it's the formula. So how does that work? Well, our capturing facility is 33,000 square feet. We can expand to 51,000 square feet. And again, I mentioned there's only six of us in the world. There are two in Australia and four in the United States, one in Oregon. And believe it or not, there are three in Texas. But guess where they are? People from Texas, Austin, guess where they are located? The Hills, Westlake, wow. What about the people on the east side? So I'm here to deliver that. Um, so I continue on, guys, and, and, and I tell you that we have to know what's in our water. Our water has history. The same water as the dinosaurs drunk, it's that same water you're drinking. The same water they use to drill in the earth for fracking and oil has that. The same water that our ancestors drank is that. So the natural filtration. Hey, water evaporates. You guys have paid attention in science and in school. Water evaporates, cloud, Mother Nature does its thing, dumps it. Again, our square uh, facility has 33,000 square feet. We catch it, never hits the ground, so no contamination. We get it in our holding tanks, which we have six 10,000 square, uh, uh, 10,000 gallon square tanks. So for every inch of rain falls, I collect 27,000 gallons of water. So I can supply entire cities. And imagine if I scale, when I scale, when I do scale. So again, supplying, this is the solution, not only for health and wellness, but also for the crisis that is happening around the world. And I want to be the company to provide that for my people. Thank you. Right, we're gonna keep rocking and rolling. Y'all good? Y'all yeah. good? I just put something on Twitter a second ago. And by the way, if you're still on social media, keep hashtagging. I, I like the fact that we're somewhat trending, so let's let's keep that trend out there about the Black Student Athlete Summit. But I just put something out there that I noticed uh, a few minutes ago. I know a couple of you had to step out and go catch your flights, but I noticed that at the beginning, Dr. Moore and I were talking and saying how it's crazy that at most conferences on a Friday, you got like five or ten people that stay. But here we have just just about as many people here right now as we did when we kicked off on Wednesday morning. So let's give yourselves a round of applause. That just shows how good this conference really is. And so we really appreciate you all sticking around and hanging with us. And for those of you taking later flights, we really appreciate you. So let's make that a trend. Um, our next session, uh, session 21, is going to be academic success of uh, black student athletes. And we're going to kick off with collegiate academic support offices systematically supporting black student athletes. And that's going to be Morris Council from the University of West Georgia. Samuel Hodge from The Ohio State University, and also Robert Bennett from The Ohio State University. So let's give them a round of applause as they come forward.
Good morning. As all of you know, uh, each, uh, at least many of the colleges and universities across the country that have athletic programs also have student support uh, services, student athlete support services, centers and offices. Okay, uh, we are under contract, myself and my colleagues here are under contract to uh, construct a um, edited book concerning uh, student services, student athlete services for the staff who support those students. And those are just, that's just an outline of uh, the contents of the, of the uh, text. And so my responsibility is to set the occasion, which is that we believe that uh, student services, offices, and centers uh, staff need to have guidance and a, and a resource manual to help them in terms of working with student athletes. And so Dr. Um, Bennett and Dr. Council will speak to that. Oh, wait. There we go. I gotta, I, I gotta do that down here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Y'all, y'all know, y'all know what time it is. So there, there are numerous, there are numerous challenges black student athletes face, uh, which often impact their academic and, and social lives. Um, you can look at the schools they attend, where these schools are located, the makeup of the school, the cultures they have, sexual identity. I know we often tend to kind of go in two ways when we talk about sexual identity, where it's kind of fluid, not kind of fluid, it is fluid, right? We talk about academic major. We also got to talk about the academic support staff and services that students have. The family involvement and their experience needs to be considered. Faculty relationships as well as personal drive, right? We can talk about encouraging students all that we want, but if that personal drive is not there on the field, on the court, and also in the classroom, it's pretty much null and void. We also have to realize that many, or a good number, coming from high schools that do not graduate, or excuse me, that do graduate only 65% of their seniors. Often coming from low socioeconomic backgrounds, and they also have feelings of imposter syndrome. If you think about it, institutions like University of Texas at Austin, you think about that ACT score, that SAT score that you need to be here. If we look at the student athletes that we work with, we know they don't have the 27s, the 28s, the 29s. That's not to say they're not academically prepared, right? But you, you have this sense of feeling as, as, as an imposter, right? Today's standards, we look at them now, compared to those who went to school 10 years ago, will we, will we get in? That's not rhetorical. I'm looking for a call and response on that one. <laughs> will we get in, Brother Willow? No. We would not, right? You think about all the degrees that are in this room right now, we would not be able to get into the UTs, the OSUs, the school up north, right? So we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta keep that in mind. We also have students not wanting to be, not wanting to get deemed special. I'm gonna put quotes around that, special. Because if you think about it, getting help from ADA, students are asking, why are you going to them for? You slow? But the reality is, would you rather have 60 minutes to do an exam or 120, or let's say 90? Because I know plenty of white student athletes who go to ADA to get that assistance, right? So I think for black folks in general, we gotta kinda get out of that mind frame of what actually is special. We have a, 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 an array of pictures here of black student athletes. Oftentimes we forget that the mascot is also a student athlete, right? But one of the greatest outliers, can you identify it? I gave you his gender good, right. 42, Joe Thomas, the oldest running back to ever play in co collegiate football, at the age of 55. The crazy thing is his son was playing for the Green Bay Packers at the time. So when you talk about academic support, how would we support somebody that's a non-traditional student? Not that student athlete that's 27, we're talking about somebody that's 55. How are you gonna tell somebody 55 to go to class? <laughs> right? 
Now, I, I'm joking when I say that, but you also have to keep those things in mind. All right? There's also this battle of, of, of this notion of being entitled or spoiled, when in many cases our student athletes have to send their stipends or the cost of attending checks back home. All right? This notion of damn if you do, damn if you don't. I think Brother Edmund spoke on that earlier. If I do well in class, they say I cheated. If I do bad in the class, they ask me, what the hell are you doing here? And that's something I gained at even talking with, with Leonard and Brother Harrison and Darren Kelly here at, at Texas, as well as Devin Walker. You have to keep those things in mind. And then there are more serious issues we talked about over these last three days, and that's really the mental health piece. All right? Dealing with depression, anxiety, mood disorders, what's that? <laughs> wow, good enough. <laughs> last point. You have student athletes, and, I, and, I, and this is one of the, the, more, the harder decisions for a lot of student athletes, whether or not they're professional material. And I'm not talking about professional material out in the business world. I'm talking about in the professional sports ranks, right? I knew it as a freshman, the NFL wasn't happening. I said this before, I'm five foot nine, playing center. I look at Bemper, I look at Tarek, I ain't, I ain't nowhere near their size, right? So having the, 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 the ability to recognize then, okay, what am I doing once I leave, right? And when we talk about academic support and supporting students, uh, personal and academic lives, those are some of the factors we have to keep in mind. So at the end of the day, balance is the key to life, all right? We all know that. I'm going to pass it over because my good brother Jones, Dr. Jones, has said we have five minutes. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. So those of us in the room, we're, we're practitioners, we're front linesmen. We have the privilege of working directly with student athletes. So everything Dr. Bennett mentioned is probably not novel to us, right? We have experience with it. What I'm going to suggest to you all now is that although a lot of us believe that that sensitivity to that information, the, the fact that we're woke, the fact that we're here at conferences and summits like this, allows us to, to do our job efficiently at a maximum level, I'm going to present to you that that's not always the case. So when we think about academic support, no matter where you are in the country, there are two words that are very critical in what we do, retention and eligibility, right? No matter where you're at. Simple philosophy for that. If we're keeping student athletes eligible and we're retaining them from semester to semester, that's going to increase the likelihood that they graduate. We all understand that. The other piece of that that we don't oftentimes talk about is the simple fact that there are a lot of negative consequences that come along with retention and eligibility. If we're not keeping students eligible, somebody else will. We'll lose our positions. Student athletes won't be able to compete in their sports. That's a no-no. Teams will be banned from postseason play. We don't want any of that stuff. So with those contingencies, retention and eligibility have then become our gold standard in what we do in academic support and how we show our value to our athletic departments. Now, what we're going to go, well, what I'm going to talk about moving forward is that that gold standard is not so golden when it comes to supporting our at-risk student athletes. So what you see here is a, a model, it's a, it's a variation of a multi-tiered system of support, but I thought it would be more powerful. Instead of going through the model and going through the framework, I'm going to show you all or tell you all an analogy to show just how important having a systematic framework that measures the work that we do, how important it is for our student athletes. So a lot of you are going to say, I've experienced that before. So let's say I'm a counselor at your university. We have a student athlete who is the one that the coach said, we have to have this student athlete, we'll call him scholar. Scholar is the number one ranked student athlete in the state, number one prospect. Scholar has a 14 ACT. Scholar comes from a single parent household. Scholar has a lot of home things that he has dealt with. And most notable, when we got Scholar to campus, we did our own internal assessment. We found out that Scholar read on the fourth grade level. But we like Scholar, because Scholar is a yes sir, no ma'am type of guy. And we can work with that type of student, right? And we tell ourselves, as long as student athletes put a little bit of effort in, with our resources and our support, we're going to get them to the promised land. You know, that's our belief as counselors. We get scholar in, we get them 15 credit hours of, of classes, 
They're showing up. We get to week two, then we get those reports. Reports start rolling in. Scott was not doing his readings. He's not doing his readings in the tutoring sessions. Uh, he's failing his discussions because he's not doing his readings. And now we got to go. We're the gatekeepers of the information. Guess what we have to do? We have to go to the coaches' meetings, convey that information. We go to our coaches' meetings. We say, hey, coach, we get the scholar. He's failed two discussion posts because, again, you think about our metrics, eligibility and retention. We got to talk about those things. They're important. Can't talk about them alone, but they're important. So we talk about those grades, and then they say, okay, like Shaka Smart said yesterday, we're results-oriented people. What are you going to do? And this is when the cycle starts. Uh, I'm going to coin this term here for you all. I'm sure you all have uh, experienced this. You know this well. Time sap interventions. That's what we typically do across the country. We say, well, coach, we're going to give them a little bit more tutoring. We're going to give them a little bit more time with the learning specialist. We've got a plan, though. Cycle continues. Scholar fails a few more assignments. We go to a few more coaching meetings. We sap a few, a little bit more scholars' time. And now we're creating more issues because now scholars skipping tutoring appointments because they have no time to be a student athlete. And then that is when the shift happens. As academic support personnel, we got to realize a lot of us are former student athletes. We're competitive too. And after we've thrown all our resources at our student athletes, like scholar, who we loved when they first got there, then we turn it on them and we say, well, I got mine. They need to be able to get theirs. We go to the coaches meeting, the head coach looks at the position coach, position coach looks at the counselor, and everybody's looking at Scholar. So now Scholar's coach is pulling them in the room, hey, you're gonna get out recruited. You shouldn't be here. Now the counselor's pulling Scholar in the room and saying, hey, Scholar, you know, we're doing everything we can for you. We don't want you to squander this opportunity. And Scholar's sitting there saying, I just wanna transfer or get out of here, declare early. That, that is the norm and that's what happens, right? And all that information that we learned about Scholar in the very beginning, we load that information up and we turn it right back at them. We say to Scholar, well, Scholar went to the worst school in the state. 67% students don't graduate. Well, Scholar, he reads at a fourth grade level. It, the average ACT score at our university is a 27. Scholar shouldn't be here. And Scholar has a four. So we, we, we put that information back on the student. Now, the reason that I bring this up is when we talk about our black student athletes, our black bodies, what we have to realize is we're the only group that is seen as, a, as monolithic in a negative light. So it's easy to target our black student athletes and say, well, Scholar has every pair of Jordans. His mama should have been spending that money on tutoring. Now, I'm going to reverse course for you and show you. Let's look at that same analogy with a little bit more precise measurement. We brought Scholar in, we found out that he read at a fourth grade reading level. Now what that should have told us is there are five component skills to reading. Phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. Scholar has great decoding, strong vocabulary with his peers, but where he struggles is his reading fluency. You see, he reads about 60 correct words per minute, where the average college age student reads 200 correct words per minute, and that affects his comprehension. Difference in identifying the problem, right? So what that should have told me as a counselor is, instead of putting him in that 15 credit hours that I did just in case he had to drop a class, no matter if I put a $40 million Powerball right on the table, got the keys to a 8,000 square foot house for his mama, got all of his dreams and sat him right in front of him and said, all you gotta do is read your weekly assignments, he wouldn't have the skill set to do it. And we wouldn't be able to support it because we don't know it. Now, the now what, what we propose is that the conversation needs to shift. The macro is the macro. We have to think about eligibility and, to, and retention, but we also need to shift the paradigm to where we're looking at and measuring more specific skills, like component skills. So now when I go to a coach's meeting, we can say, well, you know, Scholar didn't do great on those discussion posts. We're going to make that do what it does, do because we're going to have our people in place to do that. But when you see them, praise them, because we got his fluency up. In three weeks, he went from 60 correct words per minute to 120 correct words per minute. And I predict by the end of the spring, he won't need this service anymore. So you make sure you encourage him for that. And we'll take care of the rest. The conversation shifts when the measurement shifts. Now, I know we're short on time, but the, the, the whole premise of what we want to get across is very simple. You cannot, be a, you cannot provide quality support and you cannot be a quality advocate if you're not measuring what matters. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you. Next, we have I Now Understand Illuminating the Realities of Black College Athletes with Learning Disabilities. And this will come from Jalen Wright from here at the University of Texas at Austin and Dr. Akila carter Fansik from Prairie View A&M University. Let's give them a round of applause. Good morning, my name is uh, Jalen Wright, and as he said, I, um, I'm a student here, uh, first year master's student here at UT um, within the Health Behavior Health Education Department. Um, and to start off this uh, presentation, if we're talking about learning disabilities, is for, I want to put you guys in a position to better understand them. So let's say that this is a classroom, and in this classroom, I'm a, I am the professor, and I'm giving you 10 minutes to write, uh, write an essay whether it's like half a page, a page, write an essay on the black student athlete experience, whether it's negative, whether it's positive, and you have 10 minutes to do this. Now what if I said, put you in the position where you can only write it with your non-dominant hand? You're writing it with your non-dominant hand. Instead of giving it to you, this, uh, this prompt orally, I give it to you on a piece of paper, and you now have to read this piece of paper while I'm shaking it around, moving the words, you can't focus, you can't see it. You then have to process this information and then try to write it down with your non-dominant hand, you still only have 10 minutes. So this is, a, this is just a brief reality of a student athlete or a student in general who, has, uh, who suffers from either moderate or, or to severe uh, learning disabilities. How we have uh, Dexter Manley, Kevin Ross, Dasmin Cathy, who are, seen, or who are known for the illiteracy or um, difficulty in reading, and that can be seen as dyslexia or now learning disabilities in general. Uh, the big one up there happens to be me. I just so happen to uh, have the, uh, I have, uh, I was diagnosed with pretty much any learning disability there is, and that's, that's what I get to carry around. That's what I get to work with till this day um, and now. And that's how we get to better understand this, uh, the realities of these black college athletes. Dr. Francie. <laughs> so it brings us to this presentation of I now understand. As I was communicating with Jalen, we first met up. Um, my husband is a track and field coach at Texas A&M. Obviously, my connection then came with Jalen. And so in talking about uh, his desires to go to graduate school, I learned about all of these learning disabilities that he did have. Uh, and so even for his graduation, I gave him a box of markers of different <laughs> colors. <laughs> so he could do things. But we really became more interested in, in really trying to understand the nature of uh, learning disabilities and what it means for a student athlete. Uh, my colleagues cannot be here with me today. Dr. Jasmine Hamilton is, is back on the hill doing some important work at Prairie View. And uh, Constance Carter, who happens to be my mother, um, was not able to make it either. She's in, in the snow in Georgia. Um, but she all, uh, and all of us have worked in K-12 education. Um, my mother with the most extensive experience as a K-12 teacher, worked in special education, supervised special education, and then ended her career um, as a uh, supervisor over Title I. So got a little experience there. Okay. So one of the things that we wanted to bring to attention, and we all know this, we've talked about it in the room extensively, is the fact that we have talked about the underrepresentation of our student athletes. Right? Not the underrepresentation, under but even the underpreparedness of those student athletes. But we never really got into the details of what that underpreparedness was. We covered it from a socioeconomic status, right? A geographic location, this is where they come from. The K 12 school system, well, they're to blame. Cultural perceptions and stereotypes, when we talk about the dumb jock, right? We talked about self-identity. We talked about cognitive and non-cognitive uh, variables that can, can um, contribute to their experience. We talked about the need that we need to provide uh, the amount and different types of social support, if you will. And finally, we again, we get into this notion of athletic overrepresentation and institutional underrepresentation as being some of the causes to the challenges that they have at these institutions, okay? So what our goal is to cover a few issues today and give you some talking points, information, and things to walk away with as we get into more detail with regards to uh, learning disabilities. So uh, this brings up what learning disabilities, uh, attention deficit disorder, those are some of those main, some of the most prevalent issues that we deal with uh, in the classroom um, on a student setting. And so since we're talking about student athletes, the NCAA defines an education impacting disability as 
a current impairment that has a substantial educational impact on a student's academic performance and requires accommodation. So that can be seen as with the learning disabilities, ADHD, mental health, psychological disorders, medical conditions, deaf or hard hearing, and uh, autism spectrum disorder. So anything that can impact the ability for the student to be uh, most successful in the classroom then requires um, uh, accommodations in order to put themselves on the same level as the other students, as their peers. And so this one in five, uh, this one in five notion is going back to that K through 12 setting. So one in five children having a learning attention disorder, a learning disability. Um, and when we start to see this one in 16, one in 50, that goes for the IEPs, which are your individualized uh, educational uh, plans and your uh, section 504. So these are again accommodations that you could set in the classroom. And this is not to give a student or a student athlete an advantage, it's to give them the same opportunities and the same ability to, to perform in the classroom. So when you guys went through that little, uh, that little bit of an experience um, being in a classroom writing your essay, we really start to think about what's being tested, your knowledge on how you'd be able to write on the black student athlete and you know that material or the speed in which you do so. So when we start to get into some of the issues as it uh, relates, we talk about that one in five. And can you imagine, we have 500 student athletes. Out of those 500 student athletes, 100 of them have a learning disability. And that is some of the reality that we're dealing with. But when we talk about, the, again, the power of race, we also have to understand that race often intersects with social class. And we have this representation of this disproportionality, the disproportionate number of African Americans, and particularly even males, that get diagnosed or get placed into learning disability categories. Um, and so we have some statistics up here with regards to those that have been identified with learning disabilities. I'm going to go quickly through those numbers. But as we see, the male are higher percentage than female, black higher than um, other from an age perspective. Uh, you want to speak about that real quick? And so the significance of this age, uh, you can see that uh, for between 12 and 17 years of age, that's the higher percentage of when they're being diagnosed. That's because when you go to get these accommodations, these IEP forms, once I got to college, it was a blessing that I was able to have all the accommodations I had in high school because even my high school learning specialist, she informed me that you may not be able to have all of them. And so I was diagnosed when I was 16 years old. And so I didn't have to get retested in going into college because those results are only good for five years. But I did, uh, once I got affiliated with this university and the student disability services here, just last week they're saying that I do have to get retested if I'm to continue these services. And so just that knowledge is uh, what I'm here to share. And so we have to understand with some of those challenges when we talk about getting placed or getting identified as learning, uh, having a learning disability, the things that happen, as I show here, especially when we know about race, are repeating a grade due to lack of early or effective intervention. School discipline issues happen, so suspensions, and I'll go into more quick detail on that. And then finally, we talk about our dropout rates. Who wants to stay at school if they can't read, if they can't learn, if they're not able to do that? And so as our Ross group so indicated to us greatly yesterday, where are our student athletes or where are our black males, if you will? They're either athletes, they're um, in prison, or they're dead. And so that goes to that school to prison pipeline. So just real quick, just to kind of show the power of race as it reflects to student suspension rates, the uh, graph on the right, the map on the, the left, I should say, says all students And when we talk about suspension rates. And then we see our black students. Not a whole lot of difference. What do we break it down with male and female? Yeah, we can see uh, male and female, how it falls into this Bible Belt region. And so that's where we are getting a we're top, uh, recruiting our top athletes from. Yeah. And so I also want to emphasize, again, our black women. Um, because I know we have a lot of emphasis on our black males, but our black females are being suspended at a rate just as much or higher than our black males. So we need to keep them in mind too when we talk about these particular issues. So what does it mean about the role of race and what does it mean when we talk about our student athletes? We're in a culture, when we talk about our black culture, where we have to look at how do we value athleticism and how do we value education? What does that look like in our community? We hear these terms, oh, he's just slow. Okay. And there's a, a, several other myths that sort of go around and mantras that we use when we talk about our student athletes. And so we have that label and they don't want that label. So what do we do? We know that they're gifted in athleticism, so we push them through. Oh, well, he'll catch up or he'll figure it out. She'll figure it out. It's okay. 
Um, it's just this one course. But that one course builds to the next. And as we know, education is progressive and it builds, right? So we have to keep that in mind when we talk about the role of race. And is it something where it's an actual disability taking place um, when we talk about learning disability? Or is it something, um, you know, is it just something that people are assuming, oh, this is just how they are from a cultural perspective? And so even when we talk about that notion of this learning disability, we often find that our black males often get placed in behavior disordered when what's actually taking place is a learning disability. They're acting out due to the fact that I can't read. I can't keep up. I don't understand what you're saying. I'm having difficulty comprehending what's going on. So uh, this, in, this initial strategies for student athletes, we see raising awareness, intervening early, and building self-advocacy. If I were to attribute most of my academic um, preparedness and success in the classroom, it's because I built up this self-advocacy skills. And so I was taught by my learning specialist, my guardian angel, um, when I was in high school, that I need to learn how to talk to my professors, learn how to talk to my teachers, how to talk to my parents, um, and communicate with them the difficulties I was having in the classroom. And so when we're talking about student athletes, whether you have an unaddressed or an addressed learning disability, they need to, this, this positive self-talk needs to be on another level. So for example, me being in the classroom, um, let's say, uh, when I would get a 23, so that's a, that's a pretty low F, 23 on an exam. <laughs> I don't know if any, everybody's gotten one of those. Uh, but 23 on an, on an exam, and I would be, I'd be right next to my uh, classmate, and she'd ask me, or she or he would ask me, what did you get? And I'd tell him, oh, I got like an 88. And so they'd be like, oh, wow. I'd be like, I know, huh? So, so they'd be, so I'd have to put myself in a position to tell them that they don't get to place me into that dumb jock box. I've already, to be honest, I'm probably already in that box, so you don't get to put me in it any further. And so all throughout my life, that's kind of how I've, uh, that's kind of how, what I held myself to, because it's, that 23% doesn't display the fact that I've been studying for three weeks. That 23% doesn't display the fact that I had two tutors for this one class. I met with them every single day all throughout the week for three weeks and still got that 23. So I did the work of an A student, so you're going to treat me like an A student, and that's what I had to carry through. Yeah. So just I know we only have a few, few seconds left, but these are some athletes that have learning disabilities. And this notion of I now understand, I talked with Jalen, how did you get through? And he talked to me about he used the words of Smokey Norfolk to help him get through from day to day. And again, I know we've been going to church this whole conference, so we're going to go back to church. Uh, but our faith does help us get through. But faith is not always, and our hope is not a strategy. We've got to actually talk with some people. So here are some key things to sort of keep in mind. We need to raise awareness about learning disabilities. We need to empower parents and be real with parents and help them understand, no, your child's not just slow. Your child has a reading disability. They have difficulty understanding some math, mathematics and things of that nature. We need to equip our teachers. We need to intervene early, so get them. Think about summer bridge programs. You know those students when they come in, what they're, what's, what they're going through. We do it already with regards to personalized learning, um, tutors, learning assistants, if you will. Incorporate even social and emotional learning so they can help cope with those challenges that they're dealing with. Building self-advocacy self skills. Because the thing in K-12 is that they're mandated. But once you get to college, that student athlete has to take responsibility for themselves and go and get those accommodations, okay? They are now an adult. Focus on early post-secondary transitions. Again, I talked about the summer bridge programs. And then advocate for increased funding because we have to understand we're here at UT, but not every institution has the funding or the resources to bring in additional learning specialists to help those student athletes. So we need to look at those as other options as well. The last thing I'll just show here is um, some resources that could be used. Uh, for uh, uh, learning disabilities. And so we put our um, National Center for Learning Disability resource up there. Um, Jalen spoke about some ones as well, some books that we have listed. Yeah, so we, uh, this is an executive, executive functioning disorder. So that's one of those things that when, it, when you're talking about all the learning disabilities and what you struggle with, whether it's writing skills, oral skills, organization, reading, uh, and mathematics, that all can fall under executive functioning. That's just a book to have as a resource. So there's other books as well as magazines. Again, tap into your Institutional Disability Center, um, as well as do some of your own screening before you go into that actual assessment. Assessment costs money. 
So there's some screening that you can do, and one that I just pulled up here was a VARC analysis. It's very easy. You can find it online. They actually have an analysis that's specifically for student athletes to be able to garner some of that information. And that is us. Thank you. Let's give them another round of applause, please. All right. Next, we're going to have the resurrection of the black student athlete activist capturing lived experiences. And that's going to be Jasmine. Yes, it is pronounced Jasmine because she promptly told me at the beginning of the day her name is Jasmine. So don't mess it up. And I got it right. Jasmine George Williams from uh, Azusa Pacific University. So Jasmine, come on up, please. Give her a round of applause. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Friday. Um, before I begin, I just want to say looking out in this sea of melanin is blessing my entire soul. It has been a great, um, I've been having a great time here, so thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jasmine George Williams, as Dr. Jones said. I'm a PhD student at Azusa Pacific in Southern California, and I also serve as an assistant, direct, assistant professor um, at the University of the Vern in the College of Education. Um, as a former ball player and educator and activist, it is such a blessing to be able to work with just such a wonderful student population and be able to research um, and to serve them. So I just wanna once again say thank you to all the student athletes I've been able to work with. So the resurrection of black student activists. I like to lay the foundation, there we go, as to why. So we know that, well really since the 1500s and 1600s there's been lynchings and public executions of black bodies, but over the past five or six years, social media um, has gained a great deal of attention of uh, police brutality by the hands of law enforcement to young black men and boys. And so there's been an uprising in campus activism um, mapping police violence is a great research that the uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics has helped me really gather numbers. So as you see, 36% of unarmed people killed in police were black in 2015, despite that we only make up 13% of the U.S. population. Um, furthermore, 13 of 104 of those cases in 2015 where unarmed black person was killed by police resulted in the police officer actually being charged. So not only are these, these young men and women dying at the hands of police, but it's the non-sanctions of these law um, officers not, uh, not being reprimanded. Um, and so therefore there's been a great deal of uprising in campus activism. And so um, campus activism, it continues to rise because of the discrimination and racism that's taking place um, in society. And so students, it's becoming reminiscent of the 1960s, um, the, of the uh, civil rights movement and the black power movement, and it's a beautiful thing to see. And so um, UCLA does this survey where they uh, survey incoming freshmen in a multitude of different tenets, but they've actually added the social justice piece over the past few years. And since its inception in this survey 50 years ago, the high highest um, rise in student activism. Uh, so students come in as freshmen and say, yeah, I, I plan on participating in a, a protest or engaging in some sort of uh, social justice. And so it's really great to see uh, these young people um, connected and conscious. One particular population um, that I'd like to focus on is black student activists. So the survey also captured that um, black students were twice as likely to say that they would join campus protest um, than their, their white counterparts. Um, and so also, you know, Black Lives Matter movement has not a solely a campus phenomenon, but it's a microcosm of society. And so therefore it's been on college campuses and it's continued to fuel the movement. Um, academic institutions, we know that, you know, it's a, it's a crucial component of activism as we saw in the 1960s, as we saw in Berkeley in the 90s, um, and in all sorts of institutions across the nation. And so one student population that has a considerable impact um, in social justice is black student athlete activists. And as I said, we know that college campuses are microcosms of society. 
things that are taking place in society are spilling over in a college campus and the students are waking up and they're realizing the power that they have. And the, the really cool thing about the intersectionality of black student activists is that they have, it's depending on their gender, their race, their sport, whether they're at a dominantly white institution, an HBCU, and they're utilizing all these identities to bring about awareness um, and speak for under, underserved populations. And so the interesting thing about this population is that their actions often on the court, um, they're watched, right? And so if they are participating in something that is a misalignment to the university, especially if it is a dominant white institution, um, then that's a risk. That's a risk of either suspension, you know, a risk of being cut from the team. Um, while they're kneeling or engaging in, in different forms of social justice, they're getting spat on, racial slurs, we've all seen it in the news. But yet this population continues um, to be brave and speak up for social justice. And so my uh, research question that I am asking, I want to capture these experiences, I want to capture the motivation, um, the trials, the tribulations, and the triumphs of these uh, young men and women. And so I'm asking, what are the lived experiences of black student athlete activists in times of racial and social injustice? And so um, this is a, a long quote by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but as you see, um, this picture it's a man, very patriotic, he's got his flag on, he's mad at Kaepernick and really every uh, black student activist or black athlete activist and saying it's so unpatriotic for kneeling, but yet there's a black body bleeding right next to him and so that isn't as offensive, it seems. And so if you look at Kareem's quote, um, he talks about John Carlos and Tommy Smith at the Olympics, they're banned from the, from the Olympics and then we fast forward to today and you know, as we scroll down, he says, we still need to call attention to the same racial inequities. Failure to fix this problem is what's really un-American here. Amen. So the, the framework that I'm using for um, my dissertation and for my research is critical race theory. Um, I feel it's a perfect framework for um, the direction and, the, and um, the trajectory that I would like to go in my career, um, and especially with my dissertation and there are all the tenets I'll be incorporating, but the cornerstone is the counter narratives. Just these students walking on campus, it's a counter narrative. Walking on a campus that was not built for them um, existing in all of these different identities and now they're speaking up and so I have to capture those experiences I have to honor that not just to hear what they have to say but how can we as higher ed practitioners support these young men and women and so this is the framework that that I will be using because I'm going to be interviewing students, uh, the methodology that I will be using is qualitative and particularly phenomenology. And so what that does is I'm capturing the phenomenon of black student athlete activists, but I'm honoring their particular experiences and seeing once again how we can support them. So therefore, phenomenology is the approach that I'm going to be taking. I want to. Um, just speak quickly about some of the preliminary data that I've been able to collect. Um, and it was interesting uh, that I chose a volleyball player when I think of the, um, the panel from yesterday of the youth sports. And so this is a young lady from a, a small private liberal arts college. Um, she was a senior at the time that I interviewed her. Um, Self-identified as an activist. Uh, she was the captain on the volleyball team. She received so many accolades during her time. All American played overseas, things like that. She was the first student athlete to kneel um, at the university and she had a boyfriend and he played football, he drank the Kool-Aid so he started kneeling um, and then some of the other BSU students as well as track athletes began to kneel. So her, um, her efforts, not just kneeling but involving in a, a multitude of different social justice activities definitely really laid a foundation. Um, she also, uh, just got accepted to law school. She wants to be a civil rights attorney. And so I just found this out last week and I'm so very proud of her. I want to talk about a few themes um, that I, I uh, collected from my time with her, her personal call to activism, um, her family lineage, onlyness, white allies and leaving a legacy, 
And for the sake of time, I'll just pull out a couple of those themes. So her personal call to activism, first she started with just, um, you know, when the national anthem came on before the game, not putting her hand over her heart. Um, and then she said, you know, how can I, uh, I didn't want to be too dramatic, but she said, how can, I couldn't just stand there and honor a flag in a country that's not honoring me. And then she began to kneel, and the rest is history. The second theme um, is family lineage. Her family lineage was so rich. Her grandma uh, marched with Dr. King. Her mother and her auntie are activists. As a matter of fact, during game time or the national anthem, they would kneel with her um, in the stands. Her uncle is a civil rights attorney. Her father is an activist as well. So hearing those experiences were just so cool, and I was so very blessed to be able to spend time with her and learn about um, her lineage. And so Vargas even talks about um, family activism and community activism. And so what that is, is families that engage in activism share similar vision, commitment, and become a force to influence larger circles of their community, to initiate campaigns, marches, organizations, and projects, and this young lady has done just that. And then the last theme that I'll pull out is leaving a legacy. When I asked her, um, you know, after college, where does she want to go? She said law school. She wants to be a civil rights attorney, and so she's starting that journey. But then I asked her about as she grows her family, and she says, um, in terms of my family legacy, I want to create a very God-loving, confident, and passionate family um, that are passionate about activism as well. I just want them to know that anything is possible. They can make a change, and they can make a difference. And so the, the next stage for me, I'm very excited. I have IRB approval. I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to uh, continue. Um, but you know, we, we have to capture these experiences. It, people are talking about black student athlete activists, but where's the empirical data? Where's the research? And so that is something that I would love to contribute to, um, that gap of research. And so if you are, or if you know, um, a young black man, young black woman who are student athletes who self-identify as activists, I wanna hear your stories, I wanna honor your stories, I wanna hear about your trials and tribulations. And so that is my information up there. Um, I will come to you, I will call you, Skype session, whatever it is to, to honor your story and to continue your legacy because it needs to be heard. Um, that is all for me. Thank you so much for your time um, and God bless and I look forward to answering any questions. All right, our last presentation, oh man, we at, the we at the end. Our last presentation is adjusting the playbook, creating a game plan for program implementation in support of the black student athlete. And that's gonna be Stefan Fuqua and Kiara, or, did I say that right, Kiara or Kiara? Kiara, all right, I'm gonna make it get it right. Kiara McClendon uh, from The Ohio State University. So let's give them a round of applause as they come forward. Okay, again, my name is Stefan Fuqua. I'm presenting with Ms. Kiara McClendon. We are at The Ohio State University. We work in the Student Athlete Support Services Office in an academic capacity. I'm an academic counselor. I work with the football team. Ms. Kiara? I'm a learning specialist. I work with women's basketball, men's volleyball, softball, and synchronized swimming. And I also tutor in communication and writing. And so, oh, obviously, over the past two and a half days, We've, we've had some great presentations. We've had an, had an opportunity to network with some brilliant people. And we hope, just like with us, that you it's planted a seed of ideas so that you can take to your campus and, and act them out. So what we intend to do today is really talk about how do you change the game plan or how do you adjust the playbook and create a game plan and actually implement the ideas that you have in your head right now keep the energy that you have right now and implement them on your campus. Okay, so <clears throat> in highlighting what we believe our purpose is as black practitioners, um, we came up with this purpose statement. So we believe that we have a responsibility as a part of the Talented 10th, as role models and as educators to empower, advocate for and uplift our students, especially those who are deemed at risk. Um, and in many cases, underprepared for life in and after college, and in a lot of ways, that's the black student athlete. And so a brief overview, for, to preface the, the presentation, we wanna make a point to say that nothing, 
we do starts without the support of the student athletes. So anything we do, in our, and especially in our capacity, we want to encourage the student athletes to lead this, whatever project or whatever create, uh, creative idea you have, get them involved in the process. So we also want to talk today about the strategic approach. Dr. Miles, future Dr. Miles talked about uh, strategic planning. That's essentially what we're talking about here. So defining your why, your what, and your how. What's your why? What do you, why are you doing this? What is, what is it that is involved with doing it? And how are you going to do it? How are you going to make an impact? And so again, the preface, as an administrator, it's important to understand that the student athlete needs to be involved in the inception of, of whatever process you intend to take, or whatever idea you have, OK? This should be a student athlete driven project Obviously, as administrators, we want to serve as, as liaisons, as mentors, and it's our responsibility to do so. So one thing as administrators we want to think about is how, within this process, having the experience, do we serve as mentors to, de for, to develop the student athletes throughout this process, to give them a voice? Uh, as was mentioned you know, throughout the two and a half days we've, we've been involved here, the student athletes have a powerful voice, so with their leadership, we can help them accomplish whatever vision that we, we have. And so a little bit about the picture, if you can scroll back one time. Just real quick, we chose this picture not to highlight football or anything, but you know, Ohio State, playing in Ohio State is a, is a daunting experience, even as a viewer. I mean, 115,000 people, um, as, and so as you can imagine, as a student athlete, how intimidating it could be at times. We took a tour of the University of Texas yesterday, and it's even it's even more intimidating. So, kind of kind of comparable is when you try to implement programming specific towards this to the black student athlete, then it could be a daunting task. You can you you're going to run into barriers, like the team up north here. All right. <laughs> And so, and then, the, and then the crowd noise and all that. So that's how, that's kind of why we chose the, the image there. Okay. So um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that people start out with is, and whenever you're enacting something or doing something, you start out by defining your why. A lot of us define our why as to why we're a part of this profession, why we're learning specialists, academic advisors, what have you. And in creating programming, we want to define our why and lead back to the fact that we're supporting our student athletes. So we want to ask questions such as, why is there a need pr for programming specific to the black student athlete? We know that their experiences on college campuses are often very unique, um, and they need a special type of support. Um, so we want to ask that. Then, looking at our political climate and some of the social issues that are going on in the world right now, why now? Why are we choosing to create programming at this specific time to address our black student athletes? And then, why is this need often overlooked? So we highlight the fact that on some college campuses, there aren't very many black practitioners. There aren't very many black learning specialists. For example, I'm the only black female learning specialist at, in my department. And, and knowing that and, and addressing our black student athletes, we have to understand the need may be overlooked because we don't have people that are considering it to even be a need. So highlighting that question is important as well. We also want to talk about defining our what. Um, so again, going back to the student athletes, without going too in depth into the numbers that we've talked about uh, more than once during this um, duration of our, our seminar, um, but we want to talk about supporting them academically, um, addressing some of their needs in terms of the disparities in graduation rates, APR, things of that nature. Also looking at our more successful teams and how they're disproportionately more black student athletes on those teams, but they're also suffering academically. Then from a social standpoint, you want to talk about how you explore supporting them socially, how they get away from just identifying as student athletes and identify as people and are growing in that area as well. Then we want to um, support them personally, so again, with their identity formation and empowering them as people to lead, to ask questions, to reach out, to do things outside of their comfort zones and professionally, preparing them for the ultimate, um, the pinnacle of going to college, which is to get a job or to, to be a professional. And so for the sake of time, again, we'll, we'll try to run through this. We want to show a brief video at the end. So as black practitioners, it's our responsibility to serve as mentors, 
Um, from a professional standpoint, it'll help us continue our professional development, going through the process of navigating campus, developing relationships. And then personally, we want to continue to persevere, persevere through the face of adversity. I mean, adversity makes us all stronger. So that's a, that's a positive in this process. Okay, and then how do we get buy-in and work, and work within the system? Obviously, anytime you're employed at a university, you have to identify the culture and the system in which you work, using that to your advantage, that knowledge to your advantage. So when you present the research, make it qualitative so that you can prove your point, prove the need for, for programming for the black student athletes. Use it to your advantage. And then discuss the, the uh, psychological demands. Obviously, we, we've covered that throughout the two and a half days with the presentations and obviously through the networking. And then another aspect to defining our house, so it's easy for us to be, we're at The Ohio State University. Uh, some people believe that our budget is endless and so we can talk about creating programming that's like wonderful and st stupendous and has all of this, these bells and whistles, but what if you're not at a campus that has an expansive budget? What do you do? So you have to be innovative in your approach and maybe integrate programming into things that already exist at your university. For example, most universities may have a black student union or you know, an office of diversity and inclusion. So can you partner with those constituents on campus or those groups to get your programming off the ground? Then not only does that allow for you to get that programming out there, but it also increases your relationships with people on campus. Those people can then advocate for you and say that this programming is necessary. So working within your system, using what's already been created, and then again, being a person that supports the leadership development of our student athletes. So finding somebody to advise our student athlete led programming versus us, I'm creating a program and I'm running it and I'm doing all of this, giving the student athletes the opportunity to lead and to make a difference on campus. And then also just to kind of wrap up defining the how, you want to kind of create a safe space within your department. So again, you may not be amongst people who necessarily believe in your cause first and foremost, or may even see that cause as a threat. Why are we giving programming specifically to the black student athletes? So you want to talk with them and create a relationship built around trust, understanding, and mutual support so that they don't see your programming efforts as a threat. They see it as an advantage to your department and to your student athletes. And then you just want to identify people on campus that speak your language. So people who kind of know what you're talking about, people who believe in your cause, but then also, let's say you're coming up against a more political culture, somebody who's maybe higher up in a different department or works on campus who has an understanding of the lay of the land, they can speak on your behalf as well. And so we're gonna kind of wrap up our presentation, and this to me is the most important part of our presentation because we're, we gave one of our student athletes the opportunity to speak firsthand about what she believes is important in terms of programming for black student athletes. Hi, my name is Taylor. White. I'm a student athlete at Ohio State University and I'm majoring in sport industry. So during this past semester, I had the opportunity to go and participate in a leadership forum put on by the NCAA. So at this forum, we talked about just a bunch of everything that schools do. You, you want to try to minimize it? SAC meetings and talked about programming, of course. There was, however, no central discussion on programming for black student athletes, which is something that I think is really important because of the amount of black student athletes there are at any specific school and if there's programming for any type of group of people there should be programming also for black student athletes yeah from a from a national standpoint there's definitely a need for programming the programming that it would be specific to black student athletes just to give them a forum for them to come together 
and be together and talk to each other because you don't always get the chances to just stop talking about it or they wouldn't bring it up in the first place because I'm probably not going to agree, they're not going to want to hear me out and then it's just a pointless argument. So what's happening around us definitely does affect us and if I don't have an outlet or I don't have a group of people who I can talk to or a forum that I can go to, then it just stays bottled up inside me, which is not good for anybody. If I had the opportunity to create programming at my school, I first would go and figure out if there's actually a need for it or not. I think that understanding what the student athletes want would be the member one priority in this and second once I figured out that then I could go and find a faculty or staff member to help me just if I had questions if I needed a room for a meeting so like little things like that um, if someone told me no like that they weren't gonna help I would just ask somebody else like not everybody is gonna tell me no and if they do then we can just figure out how to have it on our own like we don't need a school regulated meeting um, and then I would just go week by week letting the people in the group choose what we wanted to talk about if something huge happened or like there was something pressing that I really felt like we needed to talk about then we c I could help to regulate that discussion so then we could all have just an open forum to talk about we'd be able to talk about stuff that's happening on our team with our coaches just everything but it would be specifically for black student athletes. The program would help in a lot of ways to like benefit the college experience of a student athlete, but I think the biggest one for me is just knowing that you have a, su a support system. And if there are other black student athletes that go to this forum, go to talk about whatever issues that are happening in their lives, and you realize that you relate to them more than you thought just because you guys play different sports, but you are both together black student athletes have the same issues or going through the same things on your teams like it's just comforting to know that there are people like you and a lot of times people who are not on majority black teams forget that and don't think that oh maybe someone on the tennis team is having the same issue maybe someone somewhere else is having a similar issue so the program would just basically help to broaden the student-athlete support system, which everybody needs. Okay, so that was Taylor from the softball team. Obviously, you know, hopefully student-athletes, you have a perspective as well, but your voice is heard. That's our presentation. Our contact information is there. Please reach out to us for, for any feedback. Thank you. All right, at this time, we're gonna have all of our presenters from this last session come up, uh, and we've got, we've got time for uh, a couple of questions. And so um, I'm gonna take the microphones and we'll come around the room. I see a hand right here, and I'll go ahead and get the microphones around. Jason and, Jason and I will be coming around with microphones. There we go. We got a question right up front here. First of all, thank you all for presenting. I'm a high school teacher, so now you're speaking a language that I understood today a little bit more. Uh, but I do have a question at the collegiate level. Are, are academic services, are, are you partnering, or these learning specialists, are you partnering, partnering with the education department and those students that want to be teachers that are specializing in those areas like special education, like the teaching practices, those things that really love education and believe they can save the world because that's why we went into education in the first place, are we partnering with them to help maybe be mentors or tutors for those student athletes that need help because they're engaged in that and as our numbers in teaching are declining, maybe that will influence or help student athletes want to be teachers because now someone helped me and now I need to help someone else. 
So are those things happening? Are we partnering with the education departments on our campuses? I, I would just say it's a campus by campus situation. So it depends on how um, open or closed an athletic department is. I mean, I think you you raise a great point in that a lot of times we aren't necessarily always tapping into those who are passionate about education and who have a special ed background. I know for learning specialists in a lot of ways and on a lot of campuses, people don't still understand what a learning specialist does. Mm -hmm. And so having that background in special ed or just in education and the theory of education and understanding all of that would be a great idea. I think there are opportunities to have more students who are tutors or who are mentors or even interns in our offices um, with education backgrounds can also um, kind of create our profession to be a little bit more rounded than what it is, across, like nationwide. I can't speak to every campus, but I think you're making a great point in that. And, and just to touch, I'm sorry. And just to touch on that a little bit, um, at two previous, I've been in three institutions, this is my third institution, and they're, they're in my experience, at least, there's an absolute, almost a requirement to do that. If you're going to um, truly support the student athletes, I think, you know, Dr. Hodges' group, um, Mr. Council here, I mean, he, he touched on it. And, and you, have to, you have to engage campus because we can only do so much, you know. And so the, the programs I had been a part of did utilize the services, whether it be education, social work, or anything that we felt was the need. So per campus, what was the need, and then how can we reach out to campus? So that that kind of was the, the philosophy that we're bringing to Ohio State and and, and hopefully making some moves uh, at our, on our campuses and then, you know, as we progress through our profession. Um, I definitely think it's campus specific. Um, at the University of the Vern, we have something called Faculty Athletics Partners. And so I'm the faculty partner for um, men's basketball. So we meet once all the uh, faculty partners and the coaches and some of the captains meet um, the beginning of the each quarter, each semester. And so one of the requirements is that we, we can go to a couple of the practices and we can also go to games. And so I'm able to speak with the young men and ask kind of what is their career goals, life after basketball. And so if I teach in the College of Ed, and specifically the graduate students, I'm preparing them to be school counselors. So those students that really are passionate about education and either they want to coach and teach, which is all intertwined. So something like that I think is really working because we're able to be mentors. Um, but it's campus specific, it's free. You know, faculty and staff just, just give a little bit of their time. And um, so far it's been really beneficial um, for, for all parties. So my name is Paul Harris from the University of Virginia, and first I just wanted to say, probably more even important than my question, thank you. Thank you for doing this work. Um, I am a high school counselor by training, so in seeing the connection from what you guys talked about to collegiate athletics um, just makes me proud. So the question that I have, the first one was actually just asked, so the second one that I had is um, <clears throat> I'm hoping you could help me resolve some conflict <laughs> that I have sometimes in working with on the Athletic Admissions com Committee where we're, I'm grappling with what Dr. Council described as someone who comes in with this maybe low ACT score and whether or not they should be admitted and then the other end of, well, if we don't take them and care for this young man or woman, where are they going to be? And so I'm kind of in between and no negotiating that. And so I'm just curious as to how you negotiate that conflict of this young man or woman isn't prepared with them being there or being involved in deciding whether or not they come and providing them the support to get to where they want to go. I hope that makes sense. But for me, there's a lot of tension and conflict on that end, and I've yet to really learn how to resolve it. So I'm hopefully, hopefully you can help me do that. So I, I'll try to address it. Uh, and and I, I'll put a spin on it when I address it. Oftentimes, we can get stu the student athletes that we really, really want we can get them in, right? Mm -hmm. We can say we've got the facilities, we've got X amount of tutors, we've got X amount of learning specialists, X amount of counselors, X amount of resources to throw at the student athlete. Now the frustration comes is, you know, once the smoke and mirrors are, are gone, we still understand that there's still challenges that these student athletes face, right? 
So I think if we redefine the conversation that we're having about those student athletes, to say, okay, we're bringing them in. Every university does. You create a large, comprehensive profile on the students when you bring them in. And typically what we do with that profile is we say, at-risk group, not at-risk group. And then we just throw it in the broom closet, right? What we should begin to start doing and thinking about, which is really going to get more campus buy-in, is saying, okay, let's take that profile, which is baseline, and let's see what our university really can do, right? So now we're at the table, we can bring data back from a class ago that said we brought this student in who was performing with these component skills, and this is where we got them, in addition to getting them out of our university with a degree. It changes the paradigm, changes the conversation. This is awesome. I mean, I really did not expect this, so I'm glad I got it. I'm right here. Um, my question is this. When you're advocating for um, 504s and IEPs while they're still in school, like K through 12, and the intimidation, I, you know, as a licensed psychotherapist, I show up to some of these meetings, and you have a room full of everybody, and it's so intimidating, and you want to flip over a table. You know, to say, stop, let's, you know, so how do you effectively get the testing done? And then with school psychologists so overwhelmed, how do you advocate for school systems to, if they can't get it done timely, to let's do another, re you know, resolution? Well, what I, the only thing that I can speak on in terms of that is, the, that like time, the amount of time that it takes, it took about three months to get my entire psycho evaluation like finished, um, especially since I was in high school. So that takes a toll on the student and the parents and everybody involved, as well as all the people who are doing, um, all the people I had to see, the specialists I had to see. And so I feel like that is what is so intimidating and that's what keeps so many people from getting these accommodations and going against the, the stigma that there is with having a learning disability. You have people who struggle through school just to not, um, just so they, um, they're not comfortable having to go through that uh, situation. But, I, so that's just my experience. I'm not sure on like a, I've only, I'm just now starting to get into this, um, get into this work. Um, and so I've only been on the student side of it so far versus the administrative. Well, I'm going to be very transparent. I spent a whopping one academic year in K-12. <laughs> um, but like I said, my parents were K-12 educators. My mom um, and uh, did a lot dealing with those things. And I actually teach a course right now um, on adaptive physical education where we work with our students and talking about the notion of IEPs and creating those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we've all been talking about throughout this conference is the need to really that level of cultural competence mm -hmm. needs to be there with our teachers in K-12, um, with diversity training needs to take place in order to communicate effectively with our parents, our parents of color, our black parents, because there is that denial of, I don't want to admit that my son or daughter has this disability. But I think we also have to understand is that we all have different learning styles and learning abilities and even their athletic selves, and some of the things that I didn't get to say, but even their athletic selves, is giftedness, is a, a, a sign of that. And so we have to be able to communicate them in a way to say, everybody learns differently. You're just having challenges here, uh, and you're just having challenges perhaps here. So I think if we can build some of those communications, um, and again, at the K-12 level, talking about that notion of, of informing parents, helping them understand mm -hmm. it across the board, because we have some of those students, and my mother, again, worked at a gifted elementary school, um, as well as worked in special education, so she's done the whole spectrum. But so those that were definitely gifted in one area, but not gifted in another. And so help those parents understand, be informative, being transparent, um, and again, be competent in order enough to know that, uh, you know, is this a behavioral issue that's taking place? or as an actual learning intellectual disability that we're dealing with, be it ADHD, which is our number one um, uh, issue right now that many are dealing with. But that mental aspect, I think, is very key, too, mm -hmm. because helping that young man or woman, that young girl um, or boy understand the mental challenges um, that go along with that, not to be ashamed, but you're going to have to deal with and cope with that. So that whole team will have to be together in developing that IEP for that young person. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. So I'm going to add to that two parts, right? There is education that needs to take place for the parent, but most importantly at the university level, we need to teach our student athletes how to self-advocate. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been in plenty of IAP meetings, SST meetings, or RTI meetings, and most of the times when you talk about your most at-risk parents, after they, they trust the teacher. They, they, they trust the specialist. So after about 10 minutes, they're agreeing, yeah, yeah, he does. He does have some focus issue. They, they don't know how to advocate. So what happens is, uh, in the K-12 area, there's idea, which we have to do all the work. Then they get to the university level, and then it's shifted, and now the only laws that protect them are discrimination laws. You can't be discriminated against for having a disability. Mm -hmm. So there is no, most times, I, I would speak to my student athletes, and they say, listen, coach want me to sign this document. All I know about my disability is I get time and a half. I know a little bit about my accommodations. They don't know about their rights from a legal standpoint. Mm -hmm. They don't know about the characteristics of their disability and how it affects their learning. They don't know any of that stuff. So there's a large education gap that we really have to be really explicit about making sure our students get. Yeah. Just to kind of add to it too, I think a lot of students are intimidated by the fact that they may have a learning disability or not want to get tested because they don't want that information to be disclosed to their coaches and their coaches to use it against them. Like, oh, well, you can't catch a pass in practice because you have ADHD or you have some other disability. And so that affects your value on the team in addition to the, your ability to learn in the classroom. And so I think um, that's just a really big issue that I see uh, with the students that I work with who have learning disabilities. And also one of the reasons why sometimes learning specialists aren't even given access to the coaches' meetings and things of that nature to keep that confidentiality and those things outside of the relationship with the coaches because we want the students to feel supported and as if they have someone who advocates for them and teaches them how to advocate for themselves but doesn't kind of conflict with their relationships with their coaches. So I think just kind of improving the relationships with, the, like the students have an understanding of those rights and, and, and ability to advocate for themselves, but then improving the relationships between what it means to have a learning disability, how to use that information to help the students from a learning perspective, but then also from an athletic perspective and what coaches really need to know and what they don't need to know. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that it doesn't, it doesn't just go away. You get accommodations that help you work with those things. You build on top of those skills. I work on everything that I've been working on since high school, I work on till this day. Um, and so when we're talking about these IEP forms, for me, to, for me to have to do that in college was probably the most uncomfortable thing. Um, to be honest, I had, um, I had accommodations for uh, the SAT, ACT, but I didn't have it for the GRE when I had to go to grad school because I wasn't comfortable even trying to go through that entire process all over again. Um, and that was just a year ago. And so these are things that the students with disabilities, uh, they struggle with um, just having that conversation. But it's really once you have that conversation, you can move forward because it's hard trying, it's hard struggling when you know that there's something out there that's there to help you. Um, hi, right here in the middle. Uh, I'm a hot I play soccer for the University of Oregon. Um, I'm probably the whitest person in attendance this year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my question is for Jasmine. You know, you say you worked with a lot of black student athletes who identify as activists. And I guess my question is, you know, do you ever, have you ever had a conversation with them about what they need from you know, white student athletes or their white teammates, especially coming from a PWI? Thank you. Um, absolutely. So one in particular, the young lady that I spoke about, um, her boyfriend actually was Caucasian. And so it was an interesting dynamic because I asked about the types of conversations they would have. And she would say that he was one of, you know, her biggest advocates. And so I asked, you know, in volleyball, just as the coach uh, noted yesterday, she, you know, usually black women on a volleyball team, it's usually they're one, maybe two on a good day. And she was, I think, the only uh, black woman on the team. And so she played club. So this was her life from elementary into college. And so I asked about, and that's why white allies was one of the, the themes. And I asked her, um, about that experience. And she said there was one instance where they actually came to Texas, I forget which institution, but they came to Texas and it was around Veterans Day. 
And she was plagued with, should I kneel? Shouldn't I? Texas is, you know, <laughs> Texas is. Um, and um, her coach pulled her to the side and said, okay, can we interest convergence, right? Can we, can you maybe just put your hand over your, right? And she had to have a conversation with her and explain, this is why I'm doing it. And because of that openness, right, for her to share, and because of that openness of her coach, she even want to know, that broke down some barriers and she said, okay. And the support, you know, she, she gained support. Um, some of her, her teammates, she was able to share, because it was right around the Trump era, um, and she was able to share and even have them go to different protests and rallies. So I think that from a coaching standpoint, um, just be open to hear, don't judge, uh, be quick to just listen um, and not give a compromise. We're seeing that a lot where, well maybe just stay in the locker room, Amen. right? No. Um, so I would have to say from the students I've been speaking with, from even the white faculty I, I interact with and work with on a daily, I just encourage them to listen um, and ask how can I be of support? And sometimes just being there and not saying anything is supportive enough. So just by you wanting to know, that's a huge step. And by utilizing that privilege that you have to just say, hey, I, I can choose to engage or not engage, use that privilege for your teammates and your friends um, to just be there, just stand in solidarity. So that's what, I, that's what I've gotten so far, and even that's what I say as an activist myself from faculty that I work with in my, in my PhD program and just friends, just be here and listen, and use your privilege to speak out against injustice. I, I would also want to challenge you with the difference from HBCU to look at Oregon. That might be a little hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> but with Jasmine's work, or Dr. Jasmine's work, um, oh, no. yeah, you get in there, when you, when you visit HBCU, there's, there's a certain culture that exists there. I'm a graduate of Morehouse, so when guys want to kneel, Morehouse understands that. But also Morehouse partnered with the NFL to have a conversation about social justice. Right, so then with alumni, it's kind of like there's a conflict there because in the, in the, at the end of the day, the NFL really blackballed Colin Kaepernick from having a job, right? You go to Tuskegee, you see the cheerleaders there taking the knee. You go to Howard, you see that, right? So what are these institutions, when you talk about institutions that were made for us, mm -hmm. because we didn't have access then, what are they providing that, let's say, we treat all the eyes on? Right. So I'm saying, I, I mean, if you want to come to Morehouse, I'll make the connection for you. Uh, they would love to have you. I would also um, recommend if you don't have the opportunity to have these conversations, um, read. And um, so what we've done in different spaces at work and then also in my program, um, we have different book clubs. So one book that in particular to really understand like the depth of why some of these men and women are kneeling and why we feel this racial battle fatigue, right? Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me. Um, Excellent, right? And even, I would suggest maybe get it on Audible because his voice, he's so passionate. Things like that. I can even, I can send you book lists and, and just, just literature. So it's one thing to be open to hear, but then if you align it with what's been already written and shared, I think that you, you could be very powerful in standing in solidarity with, um, you know, your African American, your black teammates and friends. to understand the history of it, so even to go back um, to Dr. Harry Edwards, the result of the black athlete, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to give you a lot of understanding and foundation of that. All right, last, last question for last Dr. Question? Brutus. Okay. Um, first, uh, sentiments is the same as Dr. Hill. Thank you so much for um, highlighting learning disabilities. Um, it's not something that is often a topic that's spoke of in our communities. Um, that was actually the gateway for me getting into sports psychology. And so that is the lens that I actually operate off of when I work with the student athletes in the university that I contract with. Um, one thing that I would like to kind of advise, I think the individual had the question about how do we like, you know, 
access these particular services, I think it's important to identify and recognize if you have a sports psychologist that is on campus, that is an individual that can be a mediator between the two, right? Um, that person has a little bit more access than say your uh, learning specialist might have in terms of being in those meetings. Um, using an integrated care model, I know for me specifically, I work closely with our athletic trainer because that's the person that has the, the that's the gatekeeper for prescriptions that may be needed. Um, that's the individual that I work with, with the student athlete to even fill out the application for the learning disability um, assessments that may take place on campus. There are times where the student doesn't even want to go on campus because they don't want it a part of their FERPA record, and so we re refer them out. Another way to kind of get creative if there's a low resource, if the parents are working and they have employee assistance programs, the employee assistance program provider can also help navigate those waters. Um, there's also another individual in here that has another background similar as myself in terms of certified rehabilitation counselor. If your university or institution has vocational rehabilitation counseling as a program, that's a great asset for you because they can do the assessments um, that are necessary to help identify and also make the recommendations for accommodations. And so there are ways to get around it. It's not just one way to do it. All right, let's give all of our panelists a round of applause. All right, we're now going to transition to our closing town hall, and that's going to be facilitated by my brother, uh, Devin Walker. But before we do that, I wanted to bring up the good Reverend Dr. Harrison to make a plug real quick. I know he hate that title stuff, but I'm going to give it to him because he earned it. So come on up, Dr. Harrison. Let's give him a round of applause. He's going to use the pulpit mic. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming here. I just want to give you a little bit of information that I think might be helpful to you, a resource that might be helpful to those of you that do research. Uh, a colleague of mine and I have developed what we call the Black Male Research Collective. It is a collection of peer-reviewed research dealing with black males in education. So if you are looking for articles uh, instead of going to all the different search engines, you can try this one first because it, it is focused on black males in the realm of education. And we have some issues and some uh, information, some articles in there on sport also. There are individuals in the room whose research we have featured on here, Dr. Hodge, Dr. Bemper, uh, Dr. Singer, and others. Uh, but the, the reason I wanted to Give, uh, give you this information was that if you need it, of course, use it. But if you have some published research that is in the realm of black males in the area of education, please let us know. We would like to feature your research on the site. We want to make this as, as inclusive as possible to help those who are doing research because sometimes when we go in all these different search engines and trying to find specific things on black males, it's, it's kind of difficult. So we're trying to bring all of this information into one spot so that you can find it fairly easily. Uh, if you go on the site, uh, scroll down to the bottom, there's a place where you can contact our graduate assistant to uh, submit your articles. We can't put entire articles on the site because of copyright issues, but we have the abstracts on there and we have the links that will take you to the articles. So again, we offer this as a resource for you and hope you uh, can use it. It'll be helpful. Hopefully, it'll be helpful to you. Thank you. All right. So uh, thank you all again for sticking with us. We have one last session, um, and it's a town hall. And we do this every year, not only to reflect on what we've experienced the last three days, but to reflect on the year, right? To reflect on the work that you've done, the work that you've done with your colleagues, and to really think about where do we go and where can we still go, right? So I know it's the end of the day and we're going to need everyone's collective participation in this, right? So you remember that little activity I did on the video? No, I'm not going to have you do that. But I would like it if everyone could just stand up and maybe just take a stretch. Y'all have been sitting here for three hours and we really do want everybody's participation. So if you could stand up, take a little stretch. Maybe take a deep breath in and think about, think about the work that you've done over the last year. 
Think about the work that you and your colleagues have done and think about what still needs to be done. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to turn to the person next to you and have that conversation quite briefly. And then we're gonna come together collectively and have this conversation. So turn to your partner, what did you accomplish in the last year? if you so choose. And we got folks running mics around. So we wanna start, we really wanna start by acknowledging some of the great accomplishments that we've achieved in the last year. So we're just gonna run mics. Does anybody wanna share any accomplishment, anything that they feel like is worthy of sharing with the group? that they just discussed with their partner. I would like to share Ross Behavioral Group who sponsored, was able to sponsor their first conference. We have, you all didn't get to hear it yesterday, but we have 23 programs, six outpatient clinics, several contracts, Federal Bureau of Prisons, um, Child Advocacy Center. Our whole premise is that we integrate and engage. And we've done that for the last nine years. And we, each year, Mari Ross Alexander, she sets a goal for us. And every goal that she has set, we have accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, over here. Um, so our group talked a lot about the different perspectives that we have, so we talked about doing a lot of work in the community and realizing that there are a lot of resources out there and that we need to figure out just how to partner them with some of the stuff we're doing. We also talked about teaching a class and bringing in the theory to, to bring it down to the student athletes and really infuse it into what we're doing. Um, and I didn't get a chance to share what, what, I, what I did, but one of the things I really related to the, my partners was working out now at a two year as opposed to a four year really trying to find the spaces in which a, a two-year institution can be a resource, especially for uh, schools that don't have a lot of um, resources to do a lot of the basic skills, um, pruning and teaching, and trying to figure out how my institution can partner with other institutions, because my athletes are going to four years. Thank you, Dr. Raphael. Here. Right here in the middle. At the University of Washington, this is now our fourth year bringing student athletes to this conference. Uh, within this last year, uh, we had two student athletes who attended the conference last year. From there, 
it sparked them to start a black student athlete group on campus. And there's also been money that's been set aside so we can continuously bring more student athletes. This year we actually brought four student athletes and we've had athletes from a variety of sports, from gymnastics to baseball, track and field, football, and we're continuously growing as well. So thank you. Right. Thank you. Oh, right here. Hi, my name is Jen Fry, and a few of the things is I started my own blog site, Jen Fry Talks. Um, I blog on social, on social justice issues, especially within the collegiate realm. I wrote a blog on the kneeling student athlete, um, on race and recruiting from the coaches side and also from the student, from the student athlete side, which I feel are very important. Um, I've also figured out um, that I want to do a PhD in talking to people about programs. Yeah. And lastly, yes. And lastly, um, I've been talking to a lot of coaches and staff about uh, fellowship opportunities that I think a lot of our students of, of color are missing out on. The Fulbright, Rhodes, Marshall, Mitchell, all of those programs, we are completely missing the boat because our athletes are not prepared for them. They don't even know they exist until their senior year. And then they're like, oh, I would love this two-year graduate work opportunity in England. I didn't know I had the opportunity to do it. So I'm really, I, and I'd love to talk to anyone after this, I'm really pushing you to look up your program that does Fulbright, that does Marshall or Mitchell, and get them to see your student athletes. Get them to make that your first priority so that your athletes of color can go and talk to them and see how to prepare their resume from, a fr from their first year of how they can do it, because they do amazing community service, they just do amazing things, but they don't know about these opportunities. So I push, I'm pressuring you guys to have these people come and talk to your student athletes so that we can have more students, student athletes of color doing these, because I guarantee if they did them, we would have 23% of all the total applicants as applicants of color. And so we need to push our athletes to do that. Okay. And what is your last name? Jen Fry, oh, it's Friday, just. Friday? Yeah, just to let Can we know. give a, a, a round of encouragement for the future Dr. Friday? Let's go, get that doctorate. Hey, Devin, Devin, and she's a free agent. She's looking she's a for free agent. She's looking for programs. So well, we got out. Y'all got some admissions folks in the room, you know, Texas, we need to be, we need to get on our A game. She's a free agent. She's one of mine. Competition, competition. Um, Jordan and I talked about being proud of stepping outside the student athlete box and actually getting some professional experience. Um, Jordan um, was selected as a um, campus ambassador for Soul Cycle. I got a marketing internship with the Golden State Warriors, and we're really proud of that and just stepping outside the, the stigmas that come with being a student athlete. And Isabella, be, before we give you a round of applause, can you share with the other student athletes how did you go about? reaching out and networking to obtain that internship. Yeah, definitely. So for me, um, I went and met with my athletic development um, um, professional. So that's Bobby, he's here with us today. Bobby, I just wanna recognize you. Oh, here, this is Bobby. He helped me um, to get this opportunity because he encouraged me to sit down with him and meet and talk about the possibilities that I'm interested in professionally. So um, we found some some job opportunities um, for the summer because I stayed over the summer and took some summer classes because I had to catch up with units. And so we found, um, first thing I found was a, um, the San Francisco Giants internship, like a video and board internship. And so I applied for that job, I got the interview, and I didn't know anything about baseball because I'm from Germany, we don't have baseball. And so they asked me very specific questions. And I was like, I wouldn't know, I'm sorry. I had, and it was very discouraging. So I told Bobby about it, I don't think I, I got the job. I was very disappointed and like, because I thought sports was my specialty, like I would get a, a job in sports. And um, so, but he um, kind of encouraged me again and I applied for the Warriors job. So um, I was obviously qualified on the resume, but I hadn't had that much experience talking to an interviewee. So when I went into the interview, actually, I ran into a, a girl who used to go to Cal. And she came up to me and she was very, she was like, oh my God, good to see you, Belle. She was a student athlete as well. And I thought that was going to reflect bad on me because she was going to bring up again, I'm a student athlete. And I didn't want to be associated as that in a professional environment because I thought it was more of a crutch rather than something that is an asset, you know? Um, at Calicano, that's the big problem with being a student athlete. They, it's a very academically recognized school. So being a student athlete just kind of implies, oh, you got there because of your sport. So being um, interviewed by the um, professional there just was like very encouraging because he was, he thought my assets as a student athlete would help me be like valuable. So 
that's how I got that job. Thank you. So, <laughs> folks, student athletes, you have so many transferable skills, right? Yeah. So please meet with your academic advisors, your student support specialists, and believe in yourself, right? And don't give up because the transferable skills that you all have, trust me, I work with a lot of other PhD student athletes, former student athletes, and I realized that my work ethic just ain't the same, right? I really never developed that my entire life. Dr. Harrison, like, yeah, you right. <laughs> <laughs> I got some other skill sets, all right, Doc? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right, go ahead, Doc. I just wanted to say, um, I hope those of us here who are in a position to, some, most of you are looking forward. Some of us are looking back <laughs> that are my age. But we got to look back and, and, and give opportunities for young people. To, I mean, show them the opportunities. Give them the, those opportunities. The young man who's talking in front of you right now just received a research grant from our department. So I want to give him some props. Thank you. Uh, young man over here, Albert, Dr. Albert Bemper, is in the, I'm sorry, what is it again? Diverse, uh, yeah, he's going to be in something in Diverse Magazine, which is coming out pretty soon. Uh, I've got another couple of graduate students here who are going to China this summer. Uh, a colleague and I got together, we wrote a grant to give them an opportunity to go and share sport with uh, the Chinese culture. Uh, with Brandon, I think Latrice is still here, and anybody else? I got a few other grad students in here. Um, oh, <laughs> we got the president of the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport yes. oh. in here, right. Dr. Francique. And where is Javier? Javier uh, just got invited to an international conference after he did so well at a conference in, Houston, uh, in Cuba. Uh, this, uh, this brother Panamanian <laughs> went spent some time in Panama and came back and now is in our doctoral program. So we've got some uh, great young people doing some great young things, some great things. And uh, those of us who are behind them need to push them harder to make sure that they reach their goals. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Can you go ahead. Um, yeah. So I just want to say I feel grateful to have been here. This is the first conference that I've ever presented at. And Congratulations. I also, thank you. <laughs> and I also accepted my position at Ohio State about seven months ago. And that's the first full-time full position that I've had in the field. I've worked in a number of different capacities in this field, but I'm starting out at a Power 5 institution, so that's close to my heart as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Aris Hall, and I'm a PhD candidate. And so in the last year, Jared here um, has become a member of the Delaware State baseball team, and he worked really hard to do that, so he's really happy about that as well as I am a PhD candidate and will hopefully graduate in a few months. Um, so that's happening. Elijah Duff, uh, Stony Brook University. Um, one of the goals I achieved this year was pretty much stepping outside of my comfort zone and leading like my football team. In a sense, like bringing awareness and opening the vision of them. Um, in a sense, I led a panel discussion um, called "The Walking Your Strength: Living a Successful Life Outside of Football," because I feel like um, a lot of the student athletes, in particular, like with football, a lot of them are narrow-minded. In a sense, everybody just want to go to the league. And coming from a smaller school where there aren't too many players that's in the league, um, it kind of makes you realize that you know football isn't really the only option. Like I said, me, what I was trying to do was change change that view. Um, so basically, in collective efforts with uh, Student African American Brotherhood, in which I'm a part of, um, you know, we we got into the eyes, kind of, you know, in a sense, got in connection with the athletic, depart uh, the athletic director and all, and led a discussion group, and basically with a bunch of dudes who played football in the past, but stressed the importance of being involved at your campus. And like I said, not being like a uh, narrow-minded individual. <clears throat> And, um, you know, 
in that discussion, basically, so it was around, I want to say, 25 to 30 football players, um, two coaches, and regular students, and basically, like, challenging those or knocking on those barriers and kind of addressing the elephant in the room. So, in a sense, a lot of the, um, like, a lot of the regular students didn't really understand the struggles that goes on, like I said, in the athletic community, in a sense, but they think, like I said, everything is given to us. Like I said, all the cliche stereotypes, basically. Um, and vice versa for athletes and students. And basically just, you know, um, I don't know. It was just, it was, it was a nice event. Um, yeah, I don't really do the talking too much in a sense. I don't really <laughs> <laughs> like talking in front of people too much, so my bad. Yeah. And, and thank you for sharing that because what, what you're getting at is this idea that we got to have more unity between the general black student body and the black student athletes. And once we recognize and if we look at our history, it's so clear to see when we come together and we collectively organize, we have so much power. And I know we had a conversation about that yesterday and the work that you want to do with university in terms of creating more study abroad opportunities. So I really want to encourage you to do that, my man. Thank you for your work. Hello, I'm Cameron Elder I'm from Ohio. I'm sure everybody knows our story by now, uh, the kneeling and everything. Being at a smaller school, um, after going through, you know, facing a lot of backlash from the community, um, we were able to see a lot of brighter things from as far as like the support within our college. Um, we actually uh, were able to start a, uh, a fraternity from the kneeling and we got a good group of guys together that were able to reach out to people in our community such as the police chief, mm -hmm. such as the mayor of our city to have these meetings about open dialogue and we found out that there was a lot of support that we got from stepping out of our comfort zone. After, of course, facing that backlash, we saw brighter days. And I just want to encourage everybody in here um, because each and every one of us feel very deeply about the issue. And so being at this conference was an amazing experience, first of all, because, of course, you know, we realize that as a a young athlete, it's hard to be outspoken about these sort of controversial topics. But it honestly makes me think about the, th the type of things that my father, my grandparents had to face on a day-to-day -day basis. So it, it, it kind of motivates me to, to, to carry on that type of drive and to carry on those type of open dialogues so we can see better days for African Americans. So I think it's been, uh, I think we have a lot of work to do, but um, We've made a lot of progress as far as being in Ohio and trying to reach out to different colleges, reach out to different um, people who may not see it as we see it. And being able to convince and get people to be open and have open conversations just because we want to communicate these things and un help them understand that, you know, we're not doing this kneeling thing or we're not trying to bring a lot of attention to us. We just want equal opportunity. So I think that's pretty pretty a good thing that we've been doing and there's a lot of work we have to do of course but being at this conference has been amazing experience to meet with a bunch of young people who have the same type of mindset i think we can all agree on that thank you so we'll take one more so, here and then last one here so good afternoon my name is LaShawn washington i'm a graduate research assistant here at the university of texas and i just really want to highlight the future dr arjane newton who is a first-year PhD student at UConn. Y'all can clap, don't clap for <laughs> Who is sitting next to me, who's a first-year uh, PhD student at the University of UConn. She presented earlier on interest convergence and responsiveness in athletics. She's a D1 um, ex-athlete. She played basketball, she was cold, she let you know. Um, still cold, my bad, ooh, I apologize. <laughs> Right, but what I really want to do is highlight her because she went straight through to her PhD in, in respects of maybe other people have an opposition to her, and she's been a very big inspiration in giving back to other African-American women who want to get into academia because academia is not monolithic, and it does not look a particular way. And so for conferences like this, I think it shows people who want to get a PhD like myself that they can be a scholar for one, that there is a space for black females for two, and that there is a space for people who don't have to leave their old interests behind just because they want to become a scholar. So just want to highlight her and tell her I'm proud of her. And thank you, LaShawn, who last year authored her first book. So can we give her a round of applause? Uh, hi again, Jasmine from uh, Zusa Pacific. I just want to say, um, once again, I'm just so appreciative to be here. 
Uh, 2017 has been such a blessing, and 2018 is going to be, oh my goodness, even more dope. Um, this year, as a part of our PhD program, we traveled internationally. So I went to South Africa, and I presented at the University of Western Cape, and I spoke about self-care and student activism, which is something that is also very near and dear to my heart. Um, right. I believe two days after that, I was a part of uh, the practitioners when I was at Cal State San Bernardino. We took a Footsteps to Freedom Underground Railroad tour. And so it was a week and we traveled to Kentucky and Michigan and Detroit and it was life changing. So summer uh, 2017 was life changing for me. It fueled my activism um, and it just fueled just my appreciation to be alive right now and be a part of the movement. So just conferences like this, I'm so happy that I've, I stumbled upon it. I saw it last year and I think I looked on it, it was like January 28th and I said, dang, I missed it. And I said, I will be there next year. And by God's grace, I am here. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. You know, can't deny to Thais. Thank you, Devin. I'm Thais Moore, and um, I just want to say that being in this room f full of people with PhDs and masters is very inspiring. Um, as I said a couple days ago, I graduated from UCLA, but even though I was there at such a prestigious institution, I did not even know what graduate school was. Um, I knew that you could go to medical school, school and law school, but I didn't know you could go to graduate school for other areas. And so I didn't know until I married my husband, Leonard, and he was doing a graduate school program, preparing undergrads for graduate school. And I was like, oh, I want to be a part of that. And he was like, you can't, you're my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and not in a way of demeaning, but he just felt awkward with having me as his wife in the program. So. Um, I was just, you know, I got to know more about grad school and all that stuff, being married to him and being exposed to so many people in academia. And I always felt very intimidated being in his circles because all I had was a bachelor's degree. And I didn't know a lot. I just wasn't exposed to a lot growing up in the family I, was, I grew up in. And so um, he's always encouraged me to do what inspires me and um, just this last year I applied to HDO program human dimensions of organizations here at the university um, and I was accepted and so I'm in grad school so I'll be able to use big words like some of you all in here um, and I think the key for me is not being afraid to ask questions of things I don't understand so like just embarrassing myself now um, Dr. Bennett, was, we were talking about the Rhodes Scholars yesterday, and I was like, well, I hated to ask you, but I was like, what is that? And he explained it, and so I just feel like I'm learning a lot, and I appreciate it, and I just want to give a shout out to my husband who had the vision for this summit years ago. <laughs> and to see what it is today, and how many people it's impacting, and um, the love and the warmth and the encouragement in the room, and I just thank you all for being here, and thank you, Devin, for that time. Thank you, Thais. So Thais and future Dr. Jasmine, um, that was a great transition. So the last thing we want to do here is we've could, we could obviously we could affirm each other. We've done great things. There's a lot of firepower in this room. But we also want to think ahead, right? What's 2018 going to be about? What are we going to do? What are we going to accomplish? What are our goals? And like folks have said, what you say? What, what's that 500-year plan? And what steps can we make towards that next year? Dr. Harrison always tells me, like, how are you going to start eating it? You gotta, how are you going to eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? I'm trying to learn that myself. Um, so again, what I want us to do now is turn to a partner, tell them what you will accomplish at your university this upcoming year. And also, I want you to exchange contact information with that person. Right? Exchange. If you already have contact information, that's great. But not just exchange it. We got to hold each other accountable. We got to be in community with each other. So turn to a partner and tell them what will you accomplish at your university this upcoming year.
My man's voice, his energy, his charisma has been amazing. Um, so thank you very much for that. He's been great, right? Um, two, the University of Texas at Austin here and Amory, we're, co we're hosting a collegiate black male retreat. Last year was our first year we did it. We had over 100 students from across the country. We're going to be doing it again. So you could go to... You can search Amory Collegiate Black Male Retreat. We'd love to have your GAs. We'd love to have your student athletes. We'd love to have anyone that you could send out there, right? Um, third, and most importantly, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for continuing to support each other, for continuing to support student athletes, and continuing to support this work. We can't have this conference without you all. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here. I love being here every single year, and we can't do it without you all. So thank you all so much. Um, and the last thing that we'll ask you to do is find other people in this room to thank and to affirm so that we all know that we are doing good work. Sometimes we go back into our universities, and you might feel like you're the only one. But coming here together, we know that we are in this together. So thank you all, um, and happy 2018.